Happy Tuesday, everybody. It is Testa and Neil. Keep it real right here on WWSU 106.9 FM or on our WWSU 106.9 YouTube channel. I'm Shay Neal alongside with me, Parker Testa. Second straight night that we're recording this late the night before. Uh, we're busy people, but we do we did promise to give you daily sports content, and that's a promise we're going to deliver on. Right. It's worth it. We're having fun, even though it's late at night and we're... Uh... It, hey, it beats getting up in the morning and recording it in the morning. So um, you don't have to listen yeah. to me yawn for twenty minutes at eight a.m. Right, right. You don't have to sit here and listen to my raspy voice in the morning when I haven't had my coffee yet. But uh, even though, even though we're 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 talking along and we're having fun while we do it. Yeah, there's a lot to get into today. Um, we have. Uh, well, at the time of recording this, the Bucks are smacking the Miami Heat. Uh, it's I, I expected a little more out of Miami, but this is what a statement for the Bucks so far. Uh, this has been a really impressive game uh, for a guy from the Horizon, Bryn Forbes. What a night he's had. We'll get into that a little bit later. Uh, Julio Jones uh, kind of stirred some controversy this morning on uh, Undisputed. Uh, he, we don't know really what Julio Jones's future brings now. We'll also get into a Bleacher Report article written by a very talented, uh, and that is, uh, excuse me, uh, Mandela Nam- Namaste, uh, wrote this earlier today. Uh, and uh, it's every NBA playoff team's biggest X factor. And I mean, like we said yesterday, this playoffs feels different. Where it feels like almost every series is a 4-5 or a 3-6. There's a lot of close matchups. So I'm curious to see kind of what each uh, what this writer feels about each team's X factor because that could really be a big impact in the series, obviously. Uh, and then in hour number two, um, we're going to continue uh, the best stadiums in sports. We still got to do college football. We still got to do college basketball. We still got to do NBA. So still plenty to get in there on that. And uh, Wright State gets a transfer from a rival in the Horizon League today, and he's quite the talented player with three years of eligibility. So a little bit later on in the show. Uh, I'll pull up the Nick Phillips press release and we'll let you know everything you need to know about the newest Wright State Raider, uh, what Bob Grant had to say, what Scott Nagy had to say, uh, but it's pretty exciting. This is a really talented player and he's going to make the Wright State Raiders a better team. Yeah, he is. Yeah, he is. Um, and that that's we that's what um, uh, it, it's just there's you can never have enough talent. And, and I think the, the Brooklyn Nets have proved that this year. So I think Scott Nagy went out and he wanted to find some some excellent players uh, to really add to their talent, to their group of talented players. You're going to need more talent with Patrick Baldwin Jr. showing up in Milwaukee. So I think I think Will Borden adds that to the Raiders. Yeah, and like you said, I mean, uh, it's just it, it's whipped cream on the you know on the cake. Uh, not only did they get a talented transfer, uh, but it's from a rival in the Horizon League. So you you get better and you make another team worse. So it's a win win. Uh, for Wright State. So I'm excited to talk more about that later on in the show. Uh, but like you said, CJ Wilborn, the newest Wright State Raider, and we'll break down everything you need to know about him a little bit later on. So let's start off with this Julio Jones topic, because I think it's the hottest topic in sports right now. Uh, I was sitting in the middle of class this morning, Parker, after doing a little bit of uh, work this morning, and uh, I saw a tweet that said, uh, did Julio Jones know he was on TV? And I'm like, what? What does that mean? And then I saw the video of Shannon Sharp calling Julio Jones live on Undisputed. Uh, Julio says, uh, when asked if he's going to stay in Atlanta, he says, nah, I'm out. And then asked if he'd ever play for the Cowboys, he said, no, I want to go to a winning organization. Uh, Do you think Julio Jones knew he was on TV? I don't. And and it it was, and I mean. It's kind of a D-bag move by Shannon Sharp, not going to lie. Right. And and Shannon knew what he was doing. There's no way that he didn't know. Uh, that he was just kind of poking and prodding on on accident. He knew what he was doing. He was trying to break some news, and he did. But he was trying to get some news. He was he was trying to get to get some some controversy stirred up, and he sure did. I mean, uh, and he didn't tell Julio that he w- that he was on air until after he said everything that he wasn't supposed to. Mm-hmm. And like I said before, we started recording, like. If Julio Jones and Shannon Sharp were boys before this, I don't know if they're boys anymore because that was that was a pretty shady move. I get that he was going for the ratings, and this was probably one of the most popular episodes of Undisputed in a long time. Uh, but, uh, I mean, Julio got kind of thrown under the bus, man. Yeah, he did. Yeah, and it, it, it's a lose-lose situation for Julio because what do you want him to say? You want him to say, "Oh, I love Atlanta. It's it's great here. I'm not leaving because we everybody knows that Atlanta's trying to trade him." Mm-hmm. Um, 
And then if he says the opposite, which he did, uh, if he says the opposite, it's a firestorm of what's going on at Atlanta. Where do you want to go? You want to go to a winner. He said he wanted to go to a winner. But when Shannon brought up the Dallas Cowboys, uh, or when Skip brought up the Dallas Cowboys, Shannon said, you want to go there because they don't win. And Julio said, yeah, I don't want to go there. So it's just a big, uh, it's, it's a big learn, mess. When will Skip learn that this isn't the 90s and nobody wants to play for the Cowboys? I think Skip loves the Cowboys more than anybody else in America. Skip Bayless loves the Cowboys more than he hates LeBron, and that's saying a lot. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think I think Skip loves the Cowboys more than Stephen A. hates the Cowboys. <laughs> Woof. And that's – I remember when the Saints beat the Cowboys – on Sunday night football and Stephen A walks in the freaking first take the next day in the in the Saints jersey and he's like, Holla at you boy. <laughs> oh man. Stephen A Stephen A Stephen Stephen A is such a character. Stephen A is I, I don't know if I want to call him the best or the worst, but he's one of the two. Um but like I said, Julio Jones, I mean just uh, Julio's been kind of a quiet guy in his career. It's never he's never really been an outspoken dude. An interesting take I saw I don't know how true this is or not. I don't think the person who said this knows how true it is or not. Uh, The way Julio worded it, where he said, I'm out of there when it comes to the Falcons, uh, maybe him saying that he doesn't necessarily want to leave Atlanta, uh, because a lot of people I've heard think that Julio Jones loves the city of Atlanta, uh, but he knows that the Falcons are going to inevitably trade him. Yeah, yeah, and and it's a tough situation, um, both for the the Falcons, because – Julio has said he wants out, and and that decreases his the it decreases the uh, trade value that Atlanta is going to get back because teams know that he wants out, and so they're not going to offer as much because they know he wants out. And if he doesn't get out by training camp, he's more than likely not going to go to camp. Right. So it it, it it decreases the trade value that Atlanta is going to get back. It increases interest because teams were, are more willing or more willing to give up less for Julio because they know he wants out. Exactly, and I mean, just reading this article, uh, Julio requested a trade for the trade from the Falcons at the beginning of the offseason back in March, uh, but the organization was trying to protect him and work quietly behind the scenes. That's what uh, a source told Adam Schefter. Uh, the Falcons prefer not to trade him in the NFC, obviously, but after today, uh, I mean, I think you just trade him for the best package you can get. Um, the Falcons, um, would like to get a first round pick in return, um, for Julio Jones. Um, do you think a team caves in and eventually gives up a first round pick? I think the two teams that come to my mind, um, that I think would emerge as front runners in the Julio Jones sweepstakes are the, are the Titans and the Niners. Yeah. Yeah. Two teams that are needy at wide receiver. The Titans of course have AJ Brown and, but that's it. That's all they got there in Tennessee. So especially because they uh, lost Corey Davis, who wasn't great. Right. He was a solid receiver. Right. And, and and so Tennessee could use him as well as San Francisco. They don't have a lot of receiver help either there. You give Trey Lance Julio Jones, I bet he learns ten times faster than if his best receiver is Brandon Ayuk. Yeah, yeah. Um and, and it, it's something that Atlanta knows that that the uh Julio wants out. They've said that they they're actively looking for a trade partner. Um, and, and I, I think I saw a tweet from, uh, from Schefter with naming a few teams. And I think, and I, and I'm pretty certain that Tennessee and, uh, and the 49ers were on that list. Um, so it, it's something that the, um, Falcons are going to, are going to delve more into here. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think, and I think just it, it, the, the, this, what happened today made this whole situation worse for the Falcons. It did. It did. And uh, something that I think something that I saw today that I never really thought about, and I don't know if they do this, but it was interesting to me is the Jaguars trade for Julio Jones in exchange for LaVisca Chenault, a second round pick and a fourth round pick. Um, I know they like Chenault a lot, but I mean, I see a lot of good in giving Trevor Lawrence a receiver like Julio Jones right off the bat. Yeah. Yeah. No doubt about it. You know, um, the guys, guy, guys who have, especially quarterbacks, guys who have experienced veterans at wide receiver. We saw it with Kyler Murray, with Larry Fitzgerald, um, and there's, I mean, just, I mean, you can go down the list of of experienced wide receivers helping young quarterbacks, uh, especially guys like, I mean, we saw it with uh, Calvin Johnson and and uh, Matt Stafford. Um, I Jack mean, Prescott you, had Des Bryant, right? I mean, you, yeah. you 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 throw to the guys 
Um, and it, it, it's like, it's like, uh, you, it's that old adage, you throw him open. You just throw the ball and somehow they catch it. Nobody knows how, nobody knows why, nobody knows, I mean, how they do it, but they catch it somehow. So, uh, and, ha- and having a guy like that improves confidence. And if you, when you improve confidence, you play better. Yeah, no doubt about it. And I think that uh, it'll be interesting to see how this uh, situation unfolds. Like you said, this makes the situation just so much harder uh, for the Falcons. Uh, Julio Jones said he wants to play for a winner. Uh, he has a base salary of $15.3 million this year. It's scheduled to cost the Falcons $23 million against the cap. Um, if the Falcons move Julio after June 1st, the move would offer Atlanta relief against the cap this year because the dead money owed would be split between this year and next. Julio's played 10 seasons with the Falcons after being selected sixth overall in the NFL draft. He's made seven Pro Bowls and was named first team All Pro in 2015 and 2016. I mean, I'm not, I mean, if the Falcons traded Julio Jones, obviously it's a, it's a step backward at wide receiver, but with Calvin Ridley, uh, Russell Gage, and Kyle Pitts, I mean, it's still a very strong receiving core. There's also Hayden Hurst at tight end. They could honestly put Pitts at wide receiver, have Hurst at tight end, and do Pitts, Ridley, and Gage. Yeah, yeah, no doubt about it. I mean, uh, right now with Julio, I think they're the best wide receiver room in football. Uh, if you lose Julio, yeah, sure, that, sure, that's knocked down a little bit. Um, but you still have Ridley, um, and you, you you add Pitts. You still have Hayden Hurst at tight end, like you said. Uh, this is a great receiving core in Atlanta, uh, especially with the combination in that tight end room and Pitts and Hurst. So um, if you trade Julio, which I think they will, mm-hmm. um, Personally, he's worth a first round pick for me because he's yeah, just that good. He's still that good. Um, and, and I know, I know Adam Schefter tweeted earlier today that uh, teams around the league don't believe that the Falcons will get a first round pick. Uh, but I think he's worth it. Uh, I really, really do. Team will cave in. Yeah. I mean, uh, for me, if I'm an NFL GM, which I'm not, um, the I, I offer a first rounder for. Or Julio, I think a fair offer for Julio is a first rounder and a fifth rounder for me. I think that's a fair offer for Julio Jones, um, and, and I think I think if I'm the GM in Atlanta, I think I take that deal because uh, after what I saw today, most teams aren't going to offer a first rounder. Yeah, and the value is only going to get lower and lower because I think now teams know that the Falcons have to get rid of them, and so the ball is no longer in Atlanta's court. They have to make a move. Uh, before kind of every team's kind of starts surrounding him like piranhas where like you saw with uh just to give an example of a team that i root for the uh, cincinnati reds had a role as chapman and then he got involved in that domestic violence dispute uh and they tried to wait as long as they could uh to trade him and then he became his value became super low because he was suspended for that domestic violence thing and then the yankees ended up only having to give up four mid-level prospects for a role as chapman none of them panned out for the reds uh, and then a couple months later, the Yankees traded Chapman to the Cubs for Glaber Torres, who was the number one prospect in baseball. And then they signed Chapman back at the end of the year. Yeah. Yeah. So it'll be interesting. In Atlanta, it breaks but... my heart knowing that the Reds could have gotten Glaber Torres. So. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's interesting uh, because the longer that Atlanta drags this out, the worse the offers are going to get, the, the, the more annoyed that the other NFL GMs are going to get. With, with the fact that Atlanta is not budging. Uh, we, we've seen teams sit there and not budge from their offers. And then what happens? The player holds out a camp. The player sits out in the season. Eventually they'll start playing, but he doesn't want to be there. Um, so it, it just creates a big stressor on the team. So the, the quicker that Atlanta can get Julio out, I think it'll be the better and they'll, be, they'll get a better offer ultimately as well. Yeah, I agree. I think that uh, this, this situation, it, it Atlanta's just got to rip the Band-Aid off at this point. Um, Julio is number one in the NFL, in NFL history, uh, averaging like 93 receiving yards a game in his career. And that's like a 15-yard edge on almost anyone else uh, per game in the receiver, uh, in the, um, excuse me, in the wide receiver room. Uh, The Falcons did sign wide receiver Tajay Sharp uh, earlier today. Uh, so maybe they're starting the plan for kind of filling some spots on that roster with the departure of Julio. So it'll be interesting to see how that story unfolds. But like I said, a really interesting situation. I don't know if I've ever, I, or if it has happened, I don't remember the last time it happened where like an athlete went on TV, not knowing they were on TV, but uh, definitely an interesting situation. And uh, Shannon Sharp kind of pulled out his sketchy journalism card today. So 
Yeah, yeah, no doubt about it. I mean, it, it it's it's an interesting uh, debate, um, or not really debate. It's just an interesting story right now. Um, it, it's like uh, th- there's there's the the NFL is is like we've talked about a year long league. There's not there's there's never a quiet day. There's always some sort of drama or some news that comes out about a contract or whatever it is. There's always something going on, and that and this Julio Jones news is is d- dominated NFL headlines today. And I think it's going to dominate the next few weeks. It'll be good to get a break from Aaron Rodgers' drama. Yeah, and then we'll go right back to Rodgers and Watson as soon as Julio gets resolved. So um, credit to the NFL. They do a good job being relevant 12 months a year. But this is the you know gossip time of the year. So uh, let's move on to the NBA. The playoffs are in full swing right now. Like I said, uh, we're doing this uh, while the Bucks heat game is going on. Uh, the Bucks, what a start in game two. Uh, now just out to a huge lead. They lead it 89 to 59 right now with seven minutes to go in the third quarter. This Heat team isn't that bad, but this Bucks team is beating the brakes off of them tonight. They sure are. I mean, and I know we talked about this yesterday that um, we, we, we said that uh, we wouldn't be surprised to see the Heat uh, come out with, with a vengeance. And I thought they... the Heat were going to win tonight. I did. Did, did they? They did not. I mean, and I, I mean, I'm I'm with you. I thought they would win tonight as well, but right now they're getting dominated. Six minutes to go in the third quarter. The Milwaukee's up 89 to 61, and it, it, they're up by almost 30 points. Um, and and what, what a game that Bryn Forbes has had. Uh, I mean, uh, in the I mean, he has 19. Giannis has 23 as we record this right now. And the Heat have struggled. Uh, Dwayne Dedman has 15. Uh, Bam Adebayo has 13. Jimmy Butler only has seven right now in the in this third quarter. So uh, the people that the Heat have been able to rely on haven't really pr- come out and performed tonight, uh, and it's really held them back. Not at all. Yeah, it's it, Jimmy Butler now combined in the first two games of this series, shooting an absolutely abysmal seven of 29 from the field. That's not the Jimmy Butler we're accustomed to seeing in the playoffs. So Miami, I mean, this team's talented enough where they could still make this a series. I mean. I don't know if they come back from down 38 in this game, but uh, or 28, however much they're down by 28. Yeah. 27. Um, I don't think they come back from that, but you're only down two. Oh, this Miami team is still good enough to win four out of six games. I think um, or four out of five, I guess it would have to be. I think they could get hot and go on that kind of run, but uh, I mean, you don't have to hit the panic button yet, but you know, you're hovering over the panic button right now. If you're Eric Spolster in the Miami heat, because right now, uh, Milwaukee's not only the better team, but they're pretty wide margin the better team. Yeah, no doubt about it. And uh, you know, the the Heat are uh, w- what we thought was going to make this a series. And and in these first two games, they've really looked abysmal. I mean, they haven't played well at all. Jimmy Butler's not shooting well, like like you said, uh, and it it shows. Jimmy Butler has been has been a really a bright spot for Miami since he arrived there. Um, but, but the, the, so far in these playoffs, he hasn't played well and it, and it's shown tonight and, and Milwaukee's just dominated. Yeah. And you said, we said, uh, after game one, really both teams kind of struggled in game one and we were like, wow, the heat played like crap, but they only lost by two in overtime. So if the heat figure it out, I think they could beat this bucks team, but the heat haven't figured it out. The bucks were the team that figured it out and the bucks, obviously when they click, I mean, they're one of the three or four best teams in the NBA. So uh, they were already good with Giannis and Middleton and DiVincenzo. Then they went out and added Drew Holiday, who's been one of the better defenders in the league this year. He also contributes 15, 20 points a night. He's also a really good, you know, secondary point guard. Uh, Drew Holiday was such a good pickup for this uh, Mike Budenholzer Bucks team, uh, and he's really starting to pay dividends. This Bucks team looks really good, and hey, if they keep playing like this, they might give Brooklyn a fight. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I mean, just to say that they, they they put up they put up ninety one points. It's still uh, halfway half quarter to go. Yeah, halfway through the third quarter. So, um, and I, I know we've talked about it. This is this is uh, offensive basketball is the name, the name of the game right now, um, and, and uh, defensive basketball has really left the window um, for for the entire NBA right now. But uh, the Bucks tonight are proving that. Defensive basketball is not dead. They they've shut down they've shut down Miami, uh, very well tonight. Uh, before we get into this article about every NBA team's biggest X factor, 
Uh, the last thing I want to talk about is about Drew Holiday. Just Drew Holiday's box score tonight. 23 minutes, 7 points, 4 rebounds, 13 assists, a steal, uh, and only 2 turnovers, and a plus-minus of plus 38. Now that tells you, I mean, that's he only has 7 points, but the plus 38, the 13 assists, the steal, we know how good of a defender Drew Holiday is. That's that kind of third star that the Bucks have always been looking for. It's always been Giannis, Middleton, and a bunch of role players, and that's never been enough. Drew Holiday is finally that third piece that they needed to get on the level of the Sixers, to get on the level of the Nets, to get on the level of the Boston Celtics when they're healthy, to get on the level of, uh, you know, the Toronto Raptors when they're healthy. Uh, this Bucks team, this is the best Bucks team we've seen in the last couple of years, and it's scary because it looks like they're starting to click. And if they're starting to click, they they have just as much of a chance of it as anybody to get out of the East. Yeah, yeah, Brooklyn is Brooklyn is obviously the team to beat in the East right now. Uh, but but my but Milwaukee's coming out of the wood gates right now and they're coming out um and they, they've shot out of the gate and they're, they're they're coming up the rear uh to 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 reference horse racing right now but uh they they they're really coming up the rear and uh we'll, we'll see how this last uh these last couple turns go for for the Miami Bucks because they they're firing on all cylinders right now they really are um and I, and right like you said I think right now uh, with the way they're playing, they are the biggest threat to, to to Brooklyn in the East right now. Absolutely, I agree. And uh, I mean, I am I expected more from Philadelphia over the weekend, and maybe they show more in Game Two. But as of right now, I think Brooklyn and Milwaukee look like the two best teams in the East, um, and then maybe Philly in third, uh, but not far behind are the Knicks and Hawks. The Knicks and Hawks looked really good as well. So uh, the East just looks like a dogfight. Uh, I don't know if anybody actually takes out Brooklyn. But it's a lot of really evenly matched teams, and that's exciting for the future of the NBA because it looks like we're finally starting to balance out, and it's not just three or four super teams. It's you know, 8, 10, 12 teams that are really evenly matched and really competitive with each other. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so can b- b- before we get into this X Factor article, uh, can I get something off my chest for a second here? Hey, fire away. So the Pacers president of basketball operations, Kevin Pritchard, had a press conference today. Okay. And he talked about the status of his team where we sit right now. And he said, I'm being evaluated. Okay, great. Coach Bjorkren is being evaluated. Understandable. Here's the problem. I doubt Herb Simon is listening to this show right now. He has millions of more things to do, like evaluating Kevin Pritchard and Nate Bjorkren. Fire these men. Please. Fire these guys. I mean, I mean, after the, the uh, I, I mean, you were lucky to make the playoffs. The clown show. You, yeah. you were lucky to make the playoffs, if you consider the play-in tournament the playoffs, which I do. You were, I mean, you were lucky. You're, Players did not like your coach. You had a coach quit because he didn't, or he had an assistant coach quit because he didn't like that coach. This is just like I said this a couple of weeks ago. This is a dumpster fire. This is not good. I have never seen the Pacers in this bad of a situation. Never. I thought the Paul George drama was bad. This is worse. This is this is this is com- this is really bad. I mean, I I can't sit here and pretend. Like I, like I enjoy this because I don't. And I know Herb Simon, who uh, historically has been somewhat relatively of a cheap owner. And I know he doesn't, he w- doesn't want to fire coach B- Bjorkren because he has to pay him for the three year, four year deal or whatever he signed. But still, I mean, if the players don't like the coach, the coach ain't around very long. If the assistant coaches quit because they don't like the coach, there's got, there's a problem. And, yeah. and, 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 you know, this this is an issue because you're gonna lose you're gonna lose Doug Doug McDermott because he's 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 really good and his contract's up and he's want, gonna want a lot of money so I have a feeling you're gonna lose McDermott um, you know there there's there's other players that won't be back I mean veterans that um, that that won't be back but they have some young guys some young talent which I think they will keep uh, I mean we've seen that in sports if you have an older guy and a younger guy and they're the same you take the younger guy it's just yeah. ba- it's basic common sense. Yep. So okay, and that that's my that's my two minute spiel on why the Pacers annoy the heck out of me. Um, and, well done. And, and if anybody from the Pacers right now is after listening, fix it because it, it's fix not fun it. to watch. Ah, oh, I like it. I love it. All right, 
Well, we're about halfway through hour number one. We appreciate you hanging out with us here on WWSU 106.9 or our YouTube channel. However you're hanging out with us, we appreciate it. Let's get into this article by Mandela Namaste. Uh, every NBA playoff team's biggest X factor. And I'm excited to get into this because, like we said, there's a lot of evenly matched teams. There's a lot of really good matchups. Uh, these X factors very well could. I mean, that's the definition of an X factor, but these X factors could be what wins or loses team series. So uh, starting with the uh, let's start with, uh, you know, the hot topic right now, the Atlanta Hawks won against the Knicks on a, a game winner by Trey Young. Their biggest X factor is Bogdan Bogdanovich. Bogdan Bogdanovich has balled out of late after an injury riddled start to his career in Atlanta. He's averaged 22 points a game, four assists, almost two steals on 51% shooting, 49% from three, and 89% from the free throw line in the last month and a half. But none of that production will mean anything if he can't continue it into the playoffs. Trey Young struggled mightily against the Knicks defense this year, shooting just 36% from the field. He hit a memorable game winner in game one, but Thibodeau and the Knicks are likely to continue pressuring Young to this degree in their first round series. If that's the case, Atlanta will need its role players to pick up the slack. It's a good sign that the Hawks went 17 and five in Bogdanovich's recent stretch of excellence, but with Trey Young getting the pressure from the Knicks defense, he's going to have to step up as maybe the Hawks best scorer. You know, this is interesting because by, I mean, you think Atlanta Hawks, you think John Collins, you think Trey Young, you don't think about, yeah, right. You don't think about these other players that, that start. And I think Bogdanovich starts there in, I think he starts there at the three for, uh, for maybe he does the, uh, the Atlanta Hawks. What was that? I believe he does. I think it's Trey Bogdanovich, uh, Collins, um, Capella and there's what? is it DeAndre Hunter that starts for him? I think so. Kevin Hurd? I can't remember. It's one of the two. It might be Kevin yeah. Hurd. Right. Um, but you know, the, the these other players, I mean, you, you can't play with just two guys. I mean, I mean, no. unless unless you're Michael unless you're Jordan. LeBron and AD. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, and even then they have guys like Alex Caruso. They have guys uh there in LA that that help um there as well as Schroeder. So um, th- there's guys that the, the role players are huge in the NBA. Uh, I mean, you take a look at the Utah jazz, they have like eight role players that don't even start out of 13 players. So, um, and I know we'll get to the jazz here in a second, but, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, the Hawks are, are a sneaky good team. And I don't even think if it's sneaky, they're just a good team. They're, mm-hmm. they're, they're. They they have one of the best playoff series of of this year is is Knicks Hawks right now so, um uh, especially with, um, I I know I know um defense in New York is something that's it's stifling, mm-hmm. and uh, and Trey Young has struggled against it this year so uh Bogdan Bogdanovich is going to be huge if they want to beat the Knicks in this series. I agree. Let's move on to the Boston Celtics. I think this one's pretty self explanatory. It's Kemba Walker. Kemba Walker has been an X factor for the Celtics all season long, and his responsibilities have increased since Jalen Brown's season ending wrist surgery. Kevin, Kemba Walker's stats do not look noticeably different than in past seasons, but he's visibly struggled to regain his trademark burst before since dealing with the knee injuries through most of 2020. He did finish strong. He averaged 24.4 points per game, five rebounds, five assists on 49% shooting 39% from three over the last 10 games of the season. Uh, if Walker were perfectly healthy, he'd still be an X factor because of his NBA playoff past. Uh, but with the Celtics out of the contender conversation for the first time in several years, Walker could use this period of relatively lower stakes playoff basketball to find his footing on the sport's biggest stage. If he can, Boston might make the East's title favorites work harder than expected in the first round. With Jalen Brown out, I think this one's pretty easy. Uh, Kemba Walker's the X factor for the Celtics. He is, he is, and I know, I know. Jason Tatum is the big star on this team right now, um, and this, this comes, this comes down to it, it's not about the stars. It's, it's about the, it's about the supporting cast right now, uh, with these NBA teams. So, and 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 Kemba is that. I mean, I know he was the hot commodity when he was in Charlotte. He was great at UConn. He had some tremendous NCAA tournament moments, uh, but. Right, right now it, it's 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 Kemba, and he's he's really the Swiss Army knife for Brad yeah. Stevens right now because he's a great defender, but he can also score at will uh, when he wants to. So, um, you know, it, it's gonna be it's gonna be the Jason Tatum show for most of these playoffs. But Kemba is a great vice president to 
the uh, leadership of Jason Tatum there in in, in Boston. Uh, as as great of a coach as Brad Stevens is, Brad Stevens is. Kemba Walker is more of a veteran, and that veteran leadership is valuable here in the NBA playoffs. Yeah, it sure is. And like you said, Kemba's got a history of being just that dude in the playoffs. And I mean, I don't think, I don't know if Boston's chances are extremely minimal to beat the Brooklyn Nets without Jalen Brown. Um, But I mean, if the Boston Celtics want any sort of chance, Kemba Walker has got to be the Kemba Walker of three, four years ago uh, when he earned that max deal with the Boston Celtics. So um, this will be interesting to see for sure. Brooklyn Nets, this one might surprise you a little bit, Parker. Nicholas Claxton. The situation in Brooklyn is not dissimilar to how the Lakers have had to approach their front court since Anthony Davis. Um, Steve Nash doesn't have to worry about that specific conundrum with the Nets, but he does have some naughty internal politics to navigate. Despite Blake Gordon, Blake Griffin, excuse me, DeAndre Jordan and Jeff Green all being on the roster, all having a good amount of post- postseason experience and all being friends with the team's three superstars, none should be playing major minutes at center in the playoffs. That responsibility should fall to second year big man Nicholas Claxton a versatile and athletic defender who appears to be very low maintenance on the court, two attributes that make him almost necessary on the defensive challenged, defensively challenged roster. Almost as if to prove this point further, the Georgia alum recorded five rebounds, one block, and a 95.5 defensive rating in game one, despite only playing 11 minutes. Given his age and lack of experience, the 22-year-old probably shouldn't play a ton, but he should be getting at least as many minutes as the aforementioned trio of veterans. Maybe Nash will start Jordan or Green at center, as a sort of ceremonial designation to keep everyone uh, satiated, or maybe Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving have grown to accept exactly what we're laying out here. If the Nets want to win a title, then giving Claxton a firm rotation spot is a step in the right direction. Yeah, so I'll be honest. I had my doubts about Steve Nash when he he got the head job there in Brooklyn. Uh, But to be honest, I think I could go out there and win 52 games as the head coach of the Brooklyn Nets with that roster. And let's do Durant to do Durant things. Yeah. Right. I, I've, I've never coached basketball in my life, but I think I could go out there and win 50 games with just not even getting out of my seat. Um, and, and if, and if I do stand up and yell about yell a little bit, maybe we win 10 more games than that. But um, yeah. And it, it's, it's, I mean, th- this is interesting because it's just the, it's just the show of the stars in Brooklyn right now. Um, but when those stars aren't on the court, and they haven't always been on the court at the same time, Durant has been out. Kyrie's been hurt. Um, there's been they, they've had their they've had Even their low points. Injury, I think, right? They, they they've had their low points. So, um, and and all teams have their low points, and and you and it's about how those other players perform when those teams have low points. Because if those guys don't perform well, you're going to lose games, and if you lose games, you don't make the playoffs. So, right. uh, Claxton has been one of those guys. Who who has performed well? Um, he, he he, I mean he he's he's young, and like this says he he sh- he hasn't whole doesn't have a whole lot of experience, um, and he doesn't play a lot. But he he the, this this veteran um, this exposure to veteran leadership, and to watch these guys play and how they carry themselves is crucial to future years for Claxton. Yeah, no doubt about it. And Brooklyn, I mean Brooklyn's got a big like like this article says. Brooklyn obviously can outscore anyone in the NBA, but their problem lies on the defensive end of the floor. And Nicholas Claxton might be their best defender on that roster. So when they get to play a team like Philly uh, and, or a team like Milwaukee, you know, um, DeAndre Jordan or Blake Griffin isn't going to be able to slow down Giannis or Joel Embiid. You're going to have to have Claxton try and slow down those superstars. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and, and I know we talked about it earlier, and it's very true in, the, in this game going on right now. Um, defensive basketball is what's winning games in these playoffs, which is insane to think about because the entire season was about who can score them, who can score the most points, and whoever scores the most points wins. Uh, I mean, of, of course, that's true in any sport, but uh, this is like un- unbelievable numbers that we. This is like all star game numbers that we've seen this year from these teams. Um, so uh, defensive basketball is what's winning right now. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and and Claxton, like you said, is qu- is quite possibly one of the, it, the better defenders on that team, if not the best one. Yeah, no yeah. doubt about it. And it's been it's been quite the year uh, for the Brooklyn Nets, and Claxton has really emerged as a young talent in the NBA. Let's get to the Dallas Mavericks. The, they, uh, Mandela kind of cheated in this article, and he did two for the Mavericks. But he says, Kristaps Porzingis and Tim Hardaway Jr. We're far. Uh, 
Rumors abound about Luka Doncic and Kristaps Porzingis' relationship and inexplicable comments from Mark Cuban are not helping matters. But as long as Luka is on the Mavericks, they have a chance in the playoffs, as proved by an impressive Game 1 victory over the Clippers. Perhaps the two the two most important players not named Luka in Dallas are those acquired from the Knicks, Porzingis and Tim Hardaway Jr. Porzingis' relevance is obvious. When the big man is healthy, he's a rare scorer. Of course, the health qualifier has become increasingly relevant, causing the Latvian to lose much of the defensive versatility that was once a major part of his appeal. There's a scenario where Kawhi Leonard and Paul George attack Porzingis repeatedly, and it gets uncomfortable to watch. But if the big man is scoring at a similar clip, then the Clippers may need to worry. Hardaway, despite keeping a lower profile than Porzingis, may have quietly become even better. He posted a career-best effective field goal percentage for the second straight season, remains an elite off-ball scorer, and has talked about doing whatever it takes to win, earning praise from head coach Rick Carlisle. If Luka builds upon last year's historic playoff showing and gets the best out of Porzingis and Hardaway, not only are the Clippers in danger, the rest of the West is too. And that's what we talked about yesterday, Parker. I think this Dallas team, when they click, could come out of the West. Yeah, and I know both of us have fangirled about the combination of Luka and Porzingis in in Dallas, as well as the uh, you know the what what is really just crucial is, is the coaching matchup there in Dallas and that's and that's Rick Carlisle. Rick Carlisle is obviously one of the best coaches in the NBA right now and one of the best coaches over the last twenty years. Um, and and you know th- th- this is what's in- this is what's interesting and th- and that's why I I mean I love watching the Mavericks um, and and their bench is is, is one of the better ones. In, in basketball, I mean, I mean, I, I think no one can match the Utah Jazz's talent of depth they have on that team. But um, and, and Hardaway has, has has proven himself as one of the best role players over the last five years. He was great when he was in New York, um, and, and a lot of times he was the best player on Knicks teams that were horrible. Yeah. Um, so uh, Hardaway is obviously, like this article says, an X factor. He's important to the success of Rick Carlisle's team. Uh, as well as Porzingis, so um, somebody needs to be the backup man to to uh, Luca. I think that's Porzingis right now, but but uh, you know you know uh, Tim Hard Tim Hardaway is definitely uh, n- n- not a pushover guy. He's a solid third string uh, star, if you will, for the Dallas Mavericks. No doubt about it. All right, well we've got about twenty minutes here left in hour number one. Um, if we don't get through all 16 teams, which we might not, we'll just continue it into hour number two. There's absolutely, you know, no pressure here on daily sports talk shows. So uh, let's get into the Nuggets. I like this one a lot. Aaron Gordon is the Denver Nuggets pick. Michael Porter Jr. could be the obvious choice here, but considering how much he wants the opportunity, how well he performed in the bubble playoffs, and how seamlessly he slid into Jamal Murray's secondary scoring role, he seems nearly as much of a given as Nikola Jokic over the course of their postseason run. Aaron Gordon, however is a different story. Denver acquired him basically as Jeremy Grant's replacement, and for a short time, the team's revamped starting lineup of Gordon, Jokic, Murray, Porter, and Barton looked dominant. However, now that Murray is gone, his playmaking and versatile scoring must be collectively replaced. With Jokic, Monte Morris, and Fasundo Campazzo in the fold, Gordon isn't necessarily a major part of Denver's ball handling solution, but he will be dependent on for more points per game an aspect of his skill set that has somewhat fallen since the trade. That added offensive responsibility combined with his status as the defensive fulcrum of the Nuggets uh, arguably vaults Gordon past Porter as the second most important player on the Nuggets roster. Since arriving in Denver, the 25-year-old has seemed up to the challenge. He's become a defensive nuisance to everyone from Devin Booker to Luka Doncic and James Harden to Anthony Davis, and he has begun to master the various nuances Uh, that lead to buckets with Nikola Jokic. If he can continue doing so in the highest stakes game of his career so far, the Nuggets may not be missing Jamal Murray as much as we thought. Yeah, and the Nuggets are, I mean, they they have more depth than anybody else in the league. I mean, you look at this roster. If you lose Jamal Murray, who's an all-star for the rest of the season, and you're replacing him with MPJ, Aaron Gordon, Will Barton, Monte Morris, you still have Jokic, who was probably going to win MVP. I mean, this team's... Gross, man. They still have yeah. bowl coming off the bench. Yeah. So I mean, you got like you said, Gordon. No Jokic, this team is gross. They, they they lost Murray, but I mean, you got Gordon, Jokic, Porter, Will Barton, Millsap. Um, I mean, Ooh, just bro. go down the list. They're really they're good. they're so good. And it, and, it, 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 it breaks my heart that Jamal Murray got hurt because if Jamal Murray didn't get hurt, I think this is the best team in the West. 
Yeah, and you can make an argument that this is still the best team in the West right now, with even without Jamal Murray. So uh, Jokic is really good. He's an MVP finalist. Personally, I think Curry wins it. But the, the, this, this Denver team is is one that's scary in the West, and and I'm and I'm terrified if I have to go up against the the Denver Nuggets because they have so many different weapons they can throw at you. Aaron Gordon is just one of them. I mean, yeah, he's he's just. I mean, he was great in Orlando. He's a, he's won the dunk contest a couple times, and he's. I mean, the dunk contest has nothing to do with the regular basketball, mm-hmm. but um, you know, that's what Denver is. They just have a bunch of different weapons that they can throw at you. Uh, and and they use them however they want to. So uh, the Nuggets are scary to me. They really are. Yeah, no doubt about it. And I love that you mentioned. I mean, it's it's it, it's it's terrifying. They have so many different weapons, and I mean, it's you never really know how they're going to attack you, and that's what's scary. And I don't think they have a top top tier coach, but Michael Malone's a very very good coach. I mean, he's not. Greg Popovich, he's not Doc Rivers, he's not uh, you know Frank Vogel, he's not one of these big big NBA coach names, but Michael Malone's done a very good job with the Nuggets every single year he's been there. So, um, this Nuggets team is just really tough to beat. They're good on paper and they're good on the court. And uh, I know they lost Game One to Portland. I expect them to bounce back tonight. And even though Portland looked really good in Game One, I still expect the Nuggets to win this series. Yeah, I do too. Uh, I mean, I mean, with the talent that Dame Lillard has, I just don't think they can match up with the depth and the talent that that Denver has. That they they like like we said, there's they just throw many, throw so many different uh, players at you. Th- they throw so many different styles of play at you. Um, they switch a lot, and it makes these teams tough to stop. And 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 with the talent that Denver has and how fast they play. It, it's only a matter of time before they beat you eventually. The, what their their style is, they run you down, and then when they run you down, that's when they that's when they punch. That's when they come with the right hook, and they and they they just yeah. jab you. They punch you in the mouth, and they score at will. So exactly, um, they, the Denver Nuggets. I mean, to make a boxing reference, the Denver Nuggets reminds me a lot of you know how Floyd Mayweather fights, and it's it's kind of boring style, if you will, where they kind of you know lull you to sleep throughout the course of a game, throughout the course of a fight. Uh, not exactly the most aggressive fighter. Uh, he kind of waits for the other team to make a mistake, and then he goes. Uh, but that's what the Nuggets do. I mean, it's not the sexiest style of play, but they wait for the other team to make mistakes. They wait for the other team to fall under the pressure, and then they attack. And that's what makes them so dangerous. They don't make a lot of mistakes. They're well-coached, they're well-disciplined, and they're really freaking talented. Yeah, they are. And they're a lot of they're a hell of a lot of fun to watch. I mean, They're a really fun team to watch. They're like one of my three or four ta- favorite teams to watch in the league. Yeah, and I mean, I, I, and I mean, and those teams for me are Denver. I love watching Dallas as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, and, and and you know, I still gotta say the Lakers. LeBron and AD is still fun. Um, yeah, yeah, and, and as as an, I mean, as as annoying as super teams are, the Nets are a lot of fun to watch. And I'll tell um, you a couple teams that not a lot of people think about that. I I mean, maybe they do, but some teams that I've really liked watching this year, the Knicks. I've yes. loved watching the Knicks this year um how about the 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 i mean they didn't make the playoffs but how about the chicago bulls with zach levine and nikola vucevic that was fun um and then uh just another a team that i really really like to watch that i think is up on the rise that's the minnesota timberwolves with carl anthony towns anthony edwards uh d'angelo russell uh there's a lot of really fun talent in the nba and not everyone's you know the brooklyn nets not everyone's the los angeles lakers but you turn on 95% of teams in the NBA, you're going to find one or two players that kind of catch your attention. And uh, I think, uh, you know, every basketball fan finds that one player that they kind of, you know, grow to uh, attach to and they kind of follow. Uh, for me, it's Luka Doncic. Uh, I loved Luka from the moment he was drafted. Uh, and I, I can't like, I mean, I've said there's two players in the NBA that I would drop anything to watch LeBron James and Luka Doncic. Um and it's just, uh, but it's really fun to see. Like I said earlier, it's not as bad as it was three or four years ago where it was four or five teams with three or four all-stars and that's it. That was all that was competing for the title. Now it feels like half the NBA, maybe not competing for championships, but competing for the playoffs. And that's a lot more fun when you have more competition and more stars across the board. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's true across the entire league. Uh, the, even the Cavs, st- even the Cavs who sucked. I mean, how good was Colin Sexton this year? He averaged 25 right. points a game and he's only 22 years old. Right. It's a star driven league. It's a star studded league. And those stars dominate the 
they, they dominate each market. They, they really do. It's what makes Adam Silver his money. It's what makes the owners the money, and it's what fans tune in to watch. Mm-hmm. I mean, Luka Doncic is the epitome of tune-in factor basketball. Right. And, and, and that's, and that's what the NBA is now. It's a star driven league. And, and, and that's, and that's what, I mean, that's what they supply shows like this for. They, 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 a lot, they, the NBA, we talk about the stars and we sit here and we talk about it for the entire first hour of our show because we can, and we want to, cause it's fun. Yep. So um, th- that, that's what, that's what, that's what this, this is all about. That's how the NBA makes their money star driven league and these stars are performing and it's a lot of fun to watch. Yeah. And I mean, we just talked about the nuggets and how deep they are. Nobody tunes into the nuggets to watch Paul Millsap and, you know, uh, Will Barton. They're solid players that basketball fans respect, but people turn into the nuggets to watch Jokic. People tune into the warriors to watch Curry. Nobody tunes into the warriors to watch Draymond Green play defense. Let's be real. People tune into the Lakers to watch LeBron and AD. People tune into the Mavericks to watch Luka Doncic. People tune into the Celtics to watch Jason Tatum. It's a star-driven league. People tune in for the superstars. You can respect the solid role players. You can respect the strong defensive players. But people tune in for the guys that drop 25 a night. Nobody tunes in to watch Draymond Green do anything, to be honest with you. I mean, I mean I'd rather I mean, watch I'm, Eric Pascal and Andrew Wiggins than Draymond Green. I'm tuning in to watch Curry hit a three-pointer from – three quarters across the court yeah steph curry Curry, i mean the warriors just moved their new stadium to san francisco i think steph curry could hit a three still standing in oakland right and he could shoot a three-pointer across the bay and have have nothing but net i mean that's how good he is and that's what people tune in to watch you know and 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 like 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 we said it's a star-driven league jimmy butler in miami uh milwaukee yeah, right. Doncic and Porzingis in, in Dallas. Westbrook you know, and Peel in Washington. I mean, they've been extremely fun to watch the last month. LeBron in L.A., Lillard in Portland. I mean, you, Kawhi you know, and with the Clippers. I mean, it's everywhere. Every team has a star. Yeah, you know, the and the 48 seemingly stars that Brooklyn has. I mean, you let's even, like, even, the, even the young stars, Zion in New Orleans, John Morant in Memphis. I mean, the new age, Trey Young in Atlanta, the new age of NBA players who are starting to watch those superstars too. Right, right. And, 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 that's, and that's what the playoffs is all about. The teams, even the teams that haven't made the playoffs, they, they were, they're still fun to watch. Even though, I mean, teams like the Pacers who lose a lot. They they still have their their bright spots. Sabonis is a lot of fun to watch. Oh no, um, he's great. And, and I mean, and and th- that's why people tune in in any league. They tune in to watch the stars. Football is more of a more of a team driven sport. Even though you tune in for guys like Brady, you tune in for guys like Rogers. But uh, th- that's true in any sport. The stars are fun to watch. I mean, who who doesn't love to watch Otani throw a hundred miles an hour and then go hit a four hundred fifty foot bomb? And that that's just my Otani fangirl five seconds here today but that that's that's what sports is it, it's it's always been like that um and especially that's true over the last 10 years stars are what drives these leagues it's what yep. makes monies it's what sells jerseys it's what sells tickets and and it's not going to stop anytime soon no it is not all right let's try and get through two more of these before hour number one comes to an end we're gonna have to do the rest of these in hour number two but i'm fine with that i mean this is a lot of fun um, and obviously the NBA is one of the hot topics in sports right now, but it's the NBA playoffs have been great so far. And I don't mind talking NBA for half the show every day because I'm having fun watching the NBA playoffs. And like I said, it's not just inevitably Brooklyn versus LA. It's I've seen, you know, six, seven, maybe even eight teams in the last two or three days that I think have a shot to, you know, get pretty far into the playoffs. And that's exciting. Sure is. Yeah. But like we said yesterday, None of these teams are seeded right. I mean, all these matchups are four fives. All these matchups are three sixes. Um, and, there might be like one, two, seven, but that's it. Everything else is super close. Right, right. It, I think the most irrelevant seeding is Phoenix and, and the Lakers. The Phoenix is a really good team, um, and, and a lot of people think that, fe- that th- th- these seeds should be flip flop. That the Lakers should be two, and the Suns should be seven. But no. Phoenix is a two seed and the Lakers are favored as a seven seed. And this is really a four or five. It really Suns. is. And the Suns yeah. outplayed them in game one in every they single. Did. They did. And defensive basketball is in right now. I know I've said it like 47 times in the last 10 minutes, but I don't care. It is. It's just true. Defensive mm-hmm. basketball is what's winning games right now. We've seen it tonight with, with Milwaukee and, and Miami. I mean, my and the the Bucks lead by 30 right now, 114-84 with 9 oh. minutes to go in the game. God. So, 
and that's where we sit right now at nine at ten o'clock. By the time the show's over, that game will be over. But I can tell you right now, that game is over. But yeah, yeah um, I don't think Jimmy Butler is going to come out and score thirty-five points in the next nine minutes. Not happening. And not let Giannis score at all. <laughs> right. So that defensive basketball is in right now, and I'm not going to stop saying it because. I don't care how annoyed you get with me. If you want, if you want to tell me that you're annoyed with me, at me on Twitter. I don't care. Um, it, it's just, it's just fun to watch. I mean, Lord sure. Lord. I mean, sure. People tune in to see Curry hit a three pointer. Yeah. See, sure, people tune in to see Giannis dunk on somebody. But I, I just sit here and I enjoy watching teams just get shut down. And, and who doesn't love to watch that? And Lord knows you have crap takes all the time. So if you had a bad take, I'd call you out for it. But I mean, you're right on the money here. So. Yes, yes. Call me out for my crap takes. Everybody else does, so go for it. But I this mean, I'm right on the money with though. I mean, I right. can't complain. I think you. I mean, you hit the nail on the head. So uh, it's exciting. Um, I'm actually right for once. How about that? There you go. Look at you. You, you know, even a blind squirrel finds a nut. Oh, that that cut one. That one cut deep. <laughs> even a, even a broken clock's right two times a day. Uh well we let very sad. Let's that burn. Let's get to the LA Clippers. Um the Clippers X factor is uh, late game shot making. Oh that's funny. Uh, the Clippers deserve a lot of credit. After an embarrassing collapse in the bubble, they've been generally dominated in this short uh short or, excuse me, generally dominant in this shortened season. Um they've got the third best offense in the league, the eighth best defense and a historically great bomb squad. And while there was some trepidation last year about the team's general lack of chemistry, uh, no such worries exist this year. Kawhi Leonard and Paul George played 43 games together, and lineups, including the two of them, have a 17.6 net rating. Despite the team's four seed, Ty Lue's club seems much more dialed in than last year's team did. And as Saturday's Game 1 proved once again, last year's failure looms so large that the Clippers still need to close a tough series to engender trust. Through Los Angeles, or though Los Angeles finished the year length 19th in clutch net rating, at one point it was one of the worst teams in the NBA in close games, only furthering the idea that they can't win under pressure. Winning 21 out of 30 to end the season uh, is a great way to silence such criticism, but when we're talking about a team that may be cursed, doubt isn't totally rational. The Clippers have heard all the criticism. Now it's time for them to go out, execute late, and put the internet noise to bed. We've heard so much about how Paul George uh, collapses in the playoffs. We've heard so much about how Kawhi Leonard uh, load manages and uh, isn't 100% locked in. Uh, this Clippers team, they got to they gotta wrap up. And I mean, you might not get a harder first-round draw than the Dallas Mavericks, but there's no excuses for the Clippers at this point. I mean, every single first round matchup is against a tough team. If you want to be taken seriously, if you want to be considered the Lakers biggest threat, you've got to find a way to get through Dallas because right now Porzingis is a question mark uh, and it's a bunch of role players and a 22 year old Luka Doncic. If you can't beat this team, I mean, you can't even hang with a lot of teams in the West. No, you can't. The Clippers are really still really good. Nobody. I mean, I know, I know people are, are writing them off because Dallas is great, but this team Clippers team is just as equally as great. You know, they still have Kawhi Leonard, one of the game's best players. They still have Paul George, who annoys me a lot sometimes, but he's still fantastic. So the the Clippers are they, they have the talent and and they have the they have the 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 skill set to uh to beat this Dallas team. And if they and if this Clippers team has a really good night, they're scary. They can beat any team in the in the playoffs right now. Um, and, and I know, I know everyone hates Ty Lue for how it ended in Cleveland. Uh, but, but still, I mean, he, he, he's, uh, he's a great coach. He won, he's won a finals, uh, you know, so the Clippers are good and, and there's no, there's no writing them off. None of these teams in these playoffs should be written off because they're all here for a reason. They're all the best, uh, the best eight teams in their conference. And it shows here with the Clippers. Yes, it does. And I mean, the Clippers, I, I, I don't think of myself as a Clippers hater. I don't think I openly bash the Clippers just to bash the Clippers, but I am, you know, hesitant to give them the same kind of respect that I give the Lakers and that I give the um, Golden State Warriors and that I give the uh, Boston Celtics because, I mean, the Clippers always seem to come up short in the playoffs and they've never really been able to get past the second round. Last year, they barely squeaked past Dallas only to lose to, uh, who did they lose to last year, Portland? believe so that sounds right 
because I think Dame got the Blazers to the Western Conference Finals and then they lost to the Lakers. Um, yeah, that's what happened. Uh, but um, like this Clippers team, I just can't put a ton of confidence in because they've never been able to do it before. And right now, with if Porzingis is healthy and Hardaway is healthy, I think Luka's the best player on either team right now. Uh, and this Clippers team, I, I don't know. I think Dallas has a better coach. I think Dallas has a better number one star. And I think Dallas has more depth. I think uh, I think the Clippers, I wouldn't be surprised at all if they came up short to the Dallas Mavericks. And then we're talking about, you know, one of the greatest failure, uh, one of the greatest, you know, uh, missed opportunities in the recent history of the NBA. You had Kawhi Leonard and you had Paul George and you couldn't get out of the second round. Yeah, yeah. And and, and I think this, this goes back to, uh, this. I think this goes back to coaching. Uh, and and I, as good as, as good as um, you know, Doc Rivers was uh, in Los Angeles. He had teams that that they, they just couldn't get over the hump. And I and, and I hope I hope and I hope I'm and I hope I'm wrong with this. It's just a recurring thing with the Clippers, and, and, and I have a feeling that it's going to happen again this year because Dallas is is really good. They 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 like you said they couldn't have had worse luck. Uh, that's the Clippers in drawing the Dallas Mavericks. Um, it, it's a tough draw. Um, it, it's really, it's not fair. And, and I mean, why I know it's, I know it's that old ad of life isn't fair, uh, but life hasn't been fair for Clippers fans and the Clippers organization for a long time. Yeah. They, 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 they had Chris Paul, they had Blake Griffin, they had Deandre Jordan. They still didn't win anything. So, um, give, uh, g- give Dallas credit. They're going to come out and they're going to play their asses off. Uh, and they're going to, and I think I, we both think they're going to win this series. I, and we, we made our picks. Utah. I know Utah didn't have Donovan Mitchell, but I, I wasn't overly impressed with the jazz uh, yesterday. I, I haven't been overly impressed with the Lakers. Obviously I haven't been overly impressed with the nuggets yet. I think what we've seen, it's only been, you know, uh, three days of the NBA playoffs, but what I've seen right now, the two best teams in the West to me right now and how they look, are the Suns and the Mavericks? Yeah, yeah, and and who would have thought that we would have be, been saying that about a Western Conference team? The Suns, who have been bad for God knows how long, and the Mavericks, who haven't won anything since 2011. So, yeah. um, th- th- this is this That's is a lot. Of- be the Western Conference Finals. That's insane. Right. Yeah. So, th- I mean, this is. I mean, this we we're going to be spend uh, over an hour on NBA talk. But we, the, the, it's fun. Hot topic, and we're seeing we're seeing things that the NBA hasn't seen in a while, and that's we've we've seen the, we've seen teams that are supposed to be bad teams, and they're winning, and, and it's it's a lot. It's really great to see and a lot of fun to watch. All right, well, we're gonna step away. Hour number one in the books. We still got a lot to get into. We still got to talk about the Lakers, the Grizzlies. What an upset they pulled off. How about the Miami Heat? How do they fix this drubbing to go down 2-0? The Knicks, the Sixers. The Suns, the, uh, and as well as the Blazers and the Utah Jazz. There's still so much to get into in hour number two. We also got to get into Wright State's newest star forward, C.J. Wilborn, on his way to Fairborn, Ohio, as the newest member of the Wright State Raiders. We also still got to finish up our best stadiums in sports. We still got to do college football, college basketball. This might end up being a three-day topic because we're going to hit on so much other stuff. But still so much to get into. Keep it real. Keep it locked. We're back in just a few moments. Don't go anywhere. Hour number two is coming up next.
Hour number two of Test and Neo Keep It Real right here on WWSU 106.9 and our YouTube channel, WWSU 106.9 as well. I'm Shane Neal. Parker Test will be back with us momentarily. Uh, I know we still got a lot to get into. We got to finish this NBA talk. We got to get into Wright State basketball. We got to get into the best stadiums in sports. But it's been a few days since we bragged about WWSU. And really quickly... Uh, we got these alumni liners yesterday and a few more today. How good do they sound, man? I'm so excited. They're awesome. And if the if the ones that we got today are any indication of what's to come, I'm so excited. The bar is set pretty high. So for those of you that haven't sent them into us yet, uh, you can thank Hoop because he delivered very, very solidly. And uh, the bar is set high. So uh, thanks to Hoop, uh, you got to continuously raise the bar. But we appreciate uh, all of our – I mean, our, I've said it multiple times. Uh, I mean, I challenge any org on this campus to beat us in terms of the talented and uh, loyal alumni that we that we have. Not only do they do great things after WWSU, but it's been so cool to see that they all still care about the station and that they all still care about the success that we have at WWSU. And uh, I mean, they do almost anything to support WWSU. And that's really cool coming from people that have had really, really cool uh, media careers and done some really big things. Yeah, yeah. And it's really, I mean, like you said, it's really cool because – uh, they're, they're just proving the old adage of never forget where you came from and, and right. they're, they're giving us tremendous help and, and they're, they're delivering in, in many different ways. Uh, I mean, and just, and, and, and not just doing liners for us. They're, yeah. they're helping us out in, in, in like, you know, uh, giving us, I, I giving us advice on w- what we can do to better ourselves or, uh, you know, I mean, the, 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 they're just, Something, something simple and stupid, like Justin tuned in for one of our shows a couple weeks ago and just that kind of support. I mean, it's something that not every school, not every station gets that kind of support from, you know, their alum. And that means a lot where uh, just the little like feedback I've gotten where um, I get uh, an email from Kev. I get an email from Justin that say, hey, anything you need uh, regarding WWSU, just let me know. I'd love to help any way I can. And then I get the recordings from Hoop today. I listen to him and at the end he leaves this little 10 second clip and he says, Hey Shay, this was really, really fun. I appreciate you getting me involved. Uh, Best of luck to WWSU. And if you need anything, don't hesitate to ask like just stuff like that, man. That's it's cool. And I think it's the perfect balance of we get to honor the past of WWSU. That's doing some really, really cool things and they get to be excited about the future we're building. Yeah. Yeah. And they, they, uh, it's, yeah, it's really cool to see them. Uh, just, just uh, these are all tremendously busy people, and for and for them absolutely, to... and the fact that who, I mean, I from the time I sent him the scripts to the time he sent he sent me back the recorded audio, two hours. I mean, he's the nighttime host of Hot 1029 and is also one of the big remote ops that goes out on location all day long. Uh, so he's a very, very busy dude, and the fact that he got that back to me in two hours is ridiculous. But it just shows how talented he is, how dedicated he is. And uh, how much he cares about WWSU. And like I said, I mean, that's the overwhelming feeling I've gotten from a lot of these alum. And that's really cool that, you know, five, six, eight, 10, 15 years down the road, they still have love for Dayton's right choice. And that's really cool. It is. It is. And and, and the, the support that they've given, not only uh, you and I with this show, and, and uh, but, but our, our entire staff and our station as a whole has been just unbelievable. And uh, we, we, uh, words can't describe the appreciation that we have for the help that they're giving us, and uh, and it's it's really cool to see them that they they still uh, WWSU still has a special place in their heart because because it's it's just I mean like we say all the time we're having more fun than anybody on campus so yeah. and and I'm and I I'm sure they'll tell you the same thing that they had a lot of fun when they were here too so yeah. uh, really cool to see them and there's in and, uh, have their support and this will be the last point I make because we do have to get back into the NBA but um I mean I don't know about you but just as sitting in my position kind of like my first real experience in a long time being a full-on leader overseeing a, a large group of people overseeing an organization It makes me feel like I'm doing a good job when our alum and when other orgs on campus are excited about what we're doing. Like I spoke to one of our colleagues, our good friends, Mackenzie, uh, a couple of days ago. And like uh, I every time I talk to her, I think I sound overwhelmed and stressed out and like everything's going wrong. (laughs) Well, then she's like, well, you're, you're doing stuff that I didn't even think about doing, you know, until three months after I became EIC. And I'm like, well, 
the fact that other orgs are excited about what we're doing, the facts that our alum are excited about what we're doing, <clears throat> it makes you feel like you're doing something right. And I tweeted last night and I a hundred percent mean it. <clears throat> it doesn't matter what you're doing. It doesn't matter how old you are. The best feeling in the world is when somebody tells you, you do a good job at something. Right. Right. And, and, and I mean, and, that, and that's something that everybody can understand when you, when you work, as hard as we have and we you put in the time and and, and the effort uh and, and really for us it's not even work because we're just having a lot of fun yeah um but uh w w when you work and you and you put it put in every the, the all your i mean really all the time you have um and, and I, I feel like it over the last couple of months i've spent more time at the office than i have at home yeah um, i so, agree yeah and, and so you know it, it, it when when we see alum and and the people of you know Dayton and Fairborn and 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 everybody that that just get somebody us. on the show that we played yesterday shout out or say hey from Texas. Yeah, yeah, no doubt about it. And it's 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 awesome to see everybody from uh, all over the country. I mean, even in all, all the way in Texas watching the show. So that's really cool, and the support that we've gotten from our alum. Our alums, the uh, and Second the people, our alum are the absolute best. Right, the people of Dayton and, and everybody who supports us. We can't thank you all enough because uh, it, it's been a blast. Just and not not only on this show, but for all of us at the station. All right, well, let's get back into sports because we got 50 minutes left and we still got a crap ton to get into. Uh, the LA Lakers, their X factor is Dennis Schroeder. On Wednesday night, Dennis Schroeder had a rough go of it in his third game back after missing two weeks because of protocol. The German point guard was bothered to the point of awkwardness uh, by the Golden State Warriors, finishing just 3 of 14 from the field. Uh, they were able to outlast a Warriors team that's weathered inconsistency all year, uh, but they won't, that won't be, they won't be awarded that luxury against the Phoenix Suns. Styled in the image of their floor general, Chris Paul, the Suns are a meticulous team that doesn't commit many mistakes. Monty Williams' club was a league leading 27-11 and 11 against teams over 500 this year and outlasted the Lakers in Game 1 so they must be treated like threats regardless of their general postseason inexperience. Despite LeBron and Anthony Davis's recent injury troubles, their second-half performances against the Warriors suggest they'll be locked and loaded. Schroeder, however, is a different story, and he'll be tested against Chris Paul, a former teammate who will be a handful no matter how healthy he is. How the 27-year-old handles pressure against the nine-time all-defensive selection might be the difference between the Lakers repeating and going home in the first round. Yeah, yeah, and, and like you said, I love Monty Williams, the coach there in Phoenix. Um, but He's but Schroeder, coach of the year, we've said he that is. times, but right, he, and he, he is. But uh, Schroeder is definitely one of the one of the bright spots on on this Lakers team. I love Dennis Schroeder because he's very versatile. He can play multiple different positions. Um, and, and when when guy when when LeBron ain't on the floor, when AD isn't on the floor, um, they they need guys that need to come in and run the second unit. And Schroeder's that guy. He, he comes in and he plays, um, you know, he, he, he's, he's a true point guard, but he plays, he can play multiple different positions. He, he can run the offense. He can run the defense. He's, he's, he's the, the tr a true court general for Frank Vogel there on his second team. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we've seen Schroeder just become the ultimate utility guy there, there for, for Frank Vogel in Los Angeles. So yeah. um, if, if Schroeder can continue to play well, which he has, um, this, this is this is probably one of my favorite matchups that we'll see in these playoffs because the Phoenix Suns are an interesting unit because they haven't won a whole lot. But uh, like I said, I love Monty Williams. I love the Phoenix Suns. Booker and Paul have been great. Um, but Schroeder is definitely the X factor for this team, like this article says. Um, and he needs to provide support for the Lakers if they want to win this series. No doubt about it. Let's move on to the Memphis Grizzlies. Dylan Brooks. Watching Dylan Brooks defend Stephen Curry in the play-in was a surreal experience. Steph Curry has been shredding the best defenses in the league for years and was in the midst of possibly his most thrilling stretch of basketball since his MVP season. So watching this relatively unheralded wing shadow the two-time MVP all over the court was stunning. Given that Brooks was able to bother Steph, arguably the toughest guard to cover since Kobe, Defending Donovan Mitchell should be relatively easy, right? Mitchell owned the Oregon alum in the regular season, but the two-time All-Star missed game one and could need a few games to fully reacclimate whenever he returns from a month-plus rehabbing a bad sprained ankle. With Memphis already owning a surprising series lead, if Brooks can pounce on Mitchell and slow him just enough, 
the franchise should start preparing for its second eight over one upset in a decade. On paper, beating this version of the Warriors should not mean anything for a series against the Jazz, the best team in the NBA for the majority of the season. But Golden State was favored over Memphis, had been playing great, and is expected to win any close games with uh, as long as Steph Curry's on the floor. So the Grizzlies' continued resilience should be taken very seriously. With Mitchell facing added pressure due to Game 1 loss for the Jazz and Brooks in rare form, it's possible that the Jazz fall victim to Memphis's intensity just like the Warriors did. Yeah, yeah. So... Here's here's my thing with with the Memphis Grizzlies. They they they've played hard. They've played really really hard, and and they're they're a team that a lot of people wrote off. But I love Valanciunas. He's he's one of the better big men in this league, and I love watching him play. Um, they they gave Golden State a fight, and they they, they deserve did. to they deserve to win that. They really did, and um they it, the, this was a team that you both both of us wrote off against against the warriors we just thought curry would take over and they would win this game and and uh and they did um memphis proved us wrong uh, i love john morant and, mm-hmm. and valanchunas but um like we've been saying all night these these role players and, the, and these bench players depth players on the on these teams are crucial in winning games no matter no matter you're the Brooklyn Nets or team number 30 in the league right no doubt about it and uh there's still a lot to prove if you're Memphis uh but uh I mean they're off to a very good start in this series against the Jazz and if uh Donovan Mitchell's not 100 percent in game two and the Grizzlies go back to Memphis up 2-0 uh the Jazz are hitting that panic button for sure so uh let's move on to Miami Tyler Hero the Heat have been on fire lately, winning 18 of 26 to close the season, but they have been uh, beat by the Bucks in games one and two. Game one was a close one, obviously. Game two, they got blown out tonight. Um, they didn't. They don't feel as dangerous, though, as they did in the bubble because of Tyler Hero's underwhelming play. After a thrilling postseason in 2020, Tyler Hero fell flat to start the year, shooting just 41% and 32% from three. It was a disappointing follow-up, given how much pr- promise Hero had shown last fall. Now, since April 1st, though, the Heat have started to come around, and Hero has regained some form. His performance against the Bucks will probably fall somewhere in between, uh, but if Hero continues to play with renewed confidence and remains a quality secondary playmaker, the only part of his game that has been promising all year long, then this may be last year's team all over again. Hero wasn't particularly great against the Bucks last year, but he'll face an extra challenge in Drew Holiday, if the 21-year-old is able to rise to that occasion, we may as well be talking about Miami as a finals contender once again. Uh, the Heat now down two games to none, uh, but I totally agree with this. If they're going to come back in this series, Tyler Hero has got to be the Tyler Hero of last year. Tyler Hero of last year was something that helped propel the Miami Heat to the finals. And uh, th- through these first two games, um, and as, as I mean, the, this this second game just wrapped up, Milwaukee won 132-98. to um, these, the, the, both these, or the Miami heat have struggled, struggled. Uh, Tyler here only had four points tonight and 18 minutes played. Uh, but he's got, he's got, to, he's got to have a resurgence here and, and that's, and he's single-handedly won some of these, one of the, some, won some of those games last year for the Miami heat and Eric Spolstra. So if these, if the Miami heat are going to have any shot, Tyler here has got to be, got to have a resurgence and he's got to help out. Out of bio and Butler there, and help uh, propel this team to win some games and get back in this series. No doubt about it. The Heat have their backs against the wall, and we'll see if going back to Miami can light a fire underneath the defending Eastern Conference champions, the Milwaukee Bucks. Drew Holiday. The Bucks made one major change following their loss to the Heat last fall, swapping Eric Bledsoe for Drew Holiday. The playoffs are now a clear referendum on both players. Is Holiday just the kind of upgrade Milwaukee needed? Was Bledsoe so bad that any capable point guard would do? Are both statements true? It's hard to tell quite yet, but one thing we do know is that the last time Holiday was in the playoffs, he was fantastic. In a four-game sweep of the Trailblazers in 2018, Holiday averaged 28 points and six assists per game on 57% shooting while harassing Damian Lillard. Now he has less offensive responsibility than he did in New Orleans. He plays next to, obviously, Giannis and Chris Middleton but the challenges he faces on defense might be even greater. In particular, a second-round matchup with Brooklyn looms in which Holiday would have to guard James Harden or Kyrie Irving, the latter of whom was particularly unstoppable in two matchups between the teams this year. The Nets would likely be favored in that series, lowering the pressure on Holiday somewhat, 
but considering Milwaukee moved heaven and earth to acquire the two-time All-NBA defender, there's still some level of expectation that he perform over the next couple weeks and potentially months. If he does, a title is finally within reach for the Bucs. I totally agree with this. Holiday has been great so far in this series against the Heat, uh, but guarding Tyler Hero is not guarding James Harden and Kyrie Irving. This article is completely correct. Holiday looks great right now, but how good is he going to look on James Harden or Kyrie Irving? Only time will tell. Yeah, two of the toughest guys to defend in, in basketball. There's no doubt about that. Um, and tonight, we saw it. Drew Holiday was, uh, a, you know, he, he he played well. I mean, he didn't have the greatest of games, but he had he 11 points, 7 rebounds, 15 assists. He was really the... He was so um, good. And his the, plus, I mean, I know a lot of people don't look at plus minus when they look at the box score, but just uh, his plus minus was ridiculous tonight. It just tells you how valuable he is on the floor. Not only is he a great playmaker that leads the team in assists, he can score when he needs to score, but he might be the best wing defender in the NBA. I mean, we talk Ben Simmons, we talk Rudy Gobert, we talk Draymond Green. The best defensive guard in the NBA might be Drew Holiday. Yeah, yeah, and and, it, and it's, that's something to uh, th- that a lot of people are, would be, probably be surprised at. But he, he's he's one of the better defenders in all of basketball. Um, you know, it, as as good of a, as good of a defender as you know guys like Chris Paul are. Um, you know, Drew Holiday is right up there with the, with them as some of the best defensive point guards in basketball because um, he's really been a bright spot and he's really been the uh, the uh, facilitator, if you will, uh, just dishing out assist after assist, putting up 15 of those tonight in this game against the Miami Heat. Um, he was he was really one of the uh, one of the biggest guys. He was really one of the crucial guys for the Miami uh, or not, for Milwaukee Bucks. Uh, in this game tonight, he helped assist uh, Giannis to 31, Chris Middleton to 17, Brent Brent Forbes to 22, Pat Connaughton to 15. Um, you know, so it, it when was, guys uh, like when guys like Connaughton and Forbes are scoring double digit points, that Bucks team is nearly unbeatable. Yeah, yeah. So and we saw it tonight: 132 points held Miami to 98 tonight. So heck of a performance from Milwaukee tonight. And, and if they keep playing well like that, like they are. I agree with this article. A title is in reach. Yeah, and this team, if they play like they played tonight, obviously they could knock off any team in the NBA, and that includes the Brooklyn Nets. Giannis and Middleton can click like they clicked tonight, and Drew Holiday can slow down. You don't have to stop Kyrie Irving or James Harden. Nobody can stop James Harden and Kyrie Irving. You just have to slow them down, make life uncomfortable for them. If Drew Holiday can do that, uh, this Bucks team's closer to beating the Nets than a lot of people think. And... um I think that we've seen in years past how Giannis and Middleton together works in the playoffs. It works till the second round where a duo doesn't get it done. But Drew Holiday is now that third star. And this, like I said earlier, this is the best Bucks team I've seen in the last couple of years. And I really think this might be the Bucks team that finally gets over that hill. Yeah, yeah, they have the talent. They're they're another team with with a lot of depth. I mean, they they got Connaughton. I mean, even Chenzo. Yeah. Right. Right. Divincenzo. That Bryn Forbes played well tonight off the bench. So um, they ha- they have the guys there. Um, they have one the of the best. There. And sorry to cut you off, but one of the best guys in the league. Uh, that or one of the best bench players in the league. That not a lot of people should talk about. He never really shot a three until this year, and now he's like top five in the league in threes. Bobby Portis. Yeah. Yeah. So. You know they have the pieces in place. They uh, they have Giannis. They have Giannis's brother who doesn't play. I, I just felt the need to. <laughs> they just signed him to Giannis brother. to be happy. Yes. So, um, but but another guy. I mean, PJ Tucker there as well. Bobby Portis, Pat Connaughton, uh, Divincenzo. Like there there are guys. The team. Right. The pieces are in place for this May or for this Milwaukee team to make a finals run and quite possibly win it one. Yeah, absolutely. Let's get to the Knicks. The Knicks is shooting. That is their X factor. Like most Tom Thibodeau coach teams, these Knicks are defense first. But offensive improvement has been integral to the club's success too. Julius Randle is the odds-on favorite to win most improved player. R.J. Barrett has rounded out his bag of tricks. And Alec Burks and Reggie Bullock have found a home as shooters, while Derrick Rose and Emmanuel quickly provide magic in the paint. But let's not assume that these improvements are permanent. Not so long ago, the Knicks had poor spacing. Mitchell Robinson and Nerlens Noel can't shoot. Julius Randle has never shot above 35% from range before this season, and Barrett is a career 32% three-point shooter. Rose also struggles at 31% from deep during the season. That hasn't helped. 
New York finished the regular season tied for second league wide in three point efficiency. However, it's quite possible that these new and improved jumpers abandon the Knicks, whether it's DeAndre Hunter and Clint Capella with the Hawks or Ben Simmons and Matisse Thibel with the Sixers. There are numerous terrific defenders in the East who can harass New York into bad shots. This may seem overly cautious, but it happened recently to players like Pascal Siakam who improved massively in the regular season, but forget how to shoot when defenses lock in. It may sound simple, but the Knicks' ability to continue taking and making smart decisions on offense and not panic when defensive pressure is ratcheted up will determine how far they can go in the playoffs. Yeah, yeah, it sure is. A lot of a lot of people were surprised, including myself, with this Knicks team. They, they weren't supposed to win. It's surprising when Julius Randle is your star, but he is. He's been good, and uh, as well as Derrick Rose. So, um, I mean, like, like like this this thing says, they're a defense first team, like 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 Tom Thibodeau's teams have always been. Um, but but shooting is something that that's always key. If you can't shoot, you can't win. So sh- shooting, especially against is, the Hawks, right? Um, and and they're the Hawks are a team that are that are huge inside. They have Capella, they have John Collins. So they're gonna make you force. To, they're gonna force you to shoot the ball from the perimeter. And if you can't shoot the ball well from the perimeter, you're not going to win against a Hawks team. So uh, shooting is definitely key for the Knicks. And if they can do it, I think they win the series. I agree. All right, let's get on to the Sixers. Ben Simmons. After years of valid questioning, Embiid and Simmons finally became a dominant duo this year as the Sixers posted a 15.5 net rating when their two All-Stars shared the court. But it remains to be seen if that improvement will translate to the playoffs. If Embiid continues to shoot a career-best percentage from three, Everything else will come easier, but even under that circumstance, it's tough to trust him in mano and mano battles with Brooklyn's big three, the Lakers and Clippers elite duos, or Giannis Antetokounmpo in Milwaukee. Embiid will need Simmons to act as an off-ball agent of chaos, serving as a roll man cutting to the basket or sitting in the dunker spot waiting to put back an errant jumper. The 2016 first-round pick has struggled with many of these roles throughout his career, this year included preferring to think of himself as a traditional on-ball point guard, but hopefully Doc Rivers has made Simmons realize that his willingness to stand still in the perimeter without the ball enables defenses to leave him alone and redouble their efforts to guard Embiid and the Sixers' other three players. At this point, Simmons might be the best and most versatile perimeter defender in the NBA. His Defensive Player of the Year nomination is well-earned, but if he can't find a way to be useful on offense in close games, the Sixers will be having another disappointing postseason. I completely agree. Ben Simmons got to elevate to a new level. Yeah, Ben Simmons has been widely known that he can't shoot the three ball. If he figures out how to shoot a three, he's going to be scary. There's no doubt about it. He's one of the best defenders in the game. Um, he came, he's a great he's, playmaker, right? And he he wasn't the he was the first overall pick for a reason. If he can develop a solid jump shot, uh, which is an issue with guys now, they don't really have a jump shot because it, a lot of it's. Uh, either they're shooting a three from deep or they're working the ball inside. And the mid-range shot is dead in today's game right now. And and, and guys don't have jump shots. So if, if, if uh, um, like guys like Giannis, Giannis doesn't have a jump shot, a great, a great one at that. But um, if Simmons can develop the ability to shoot the three ball, he's going to be scary. And, and that, that goes along with an already scary Sixers team. Let's move on to the Phoenix Suns, maybe the you know the darling of the playoffs so far, if you will. DeAndre Ayton. DeAndre Ayton's improvement has been covered a lot this season. Chris Paul recently said he's grown more than any other player in Phoenix, and Paul isn't exactly known for praising his teammates. But if Phoenix wants to live up to its second seed billing and advance deep into the playoffs, Ayton must continuously rise to the occasion, particularly on defense. Obviously, the first challenge comes against LeBron James, Anthony Davis, and the rest of the Lakers roster in the first round. Uh, If the big man is able to relatively neutralize them like he did in game one, another challenge may await in Nikola Jokic. Now, Aiton actually did a pretty good job of defending Jokic this year, but the postseason is a different animal. If he and the Suns win that matchup, Rudy Gobert and the Jazz may be next up. Let's not even worry about a potential class with Joel Embiid or Giannis Antetokounmpo in the finals just yet. The point is, this postseason is about to be dominated by big men, particularly in the West, and despite his high pedigree and continued growth, Aiton is pretty far behind the stars we just mentioned in virtually every department. Can he surpass expectations? Sure. The degree and nuance of his improvements thus far have been surprising, so let's not rule out another potential leap. 
If Aiton continues to grow, this Suns team could emerge out of the West as a favorite to win the championship. But if Aiton falls short against any of these decorated superstars and contributes to an underwhelming showing for Phoenix, that also wouldn't be a surprise. Yeah, we talked about this yesterday. Got a, uh, Teams that find a weakness, pound that weakness until they can't, you give them a reason not to. And, uh, and right now, if, if DeAndre Ayton starts to struggle inside, teams are going to work the basketball inside, and they're going to, and they're going to just tear Ayton apart if he can't defend the rim. So um, he wasn't he, – he was the number one overall pick for a reason. Another guy like Simmons, high, really high draft pick, first overall. He was good talent's in game one. De- yeah, the, the talent's definitely there. If he can continue to play well like he did in game one, I see no reason why the Suns don't advance deep into these playoffs. And I agree. I think that, I mean, just reading off of that hypothetical, is there a harder route to the finals for a young center than Anthony Davis, Nikola Jokic, Rudy Gobert, and then potentially Giannis or Embiid in the finals? Like, good Lord, that is brutal. It's insane. It's insane. That That's that's tough. So the, the Suns have their work cut out for them, no doubt. That's hell of a yeah, yeah. If they can adv- if they can beat the Lakers, the the next round is not an easy task. No doubt about it. If the Suns beat the Lakers, though, they they're the hottest team in the league. They have all the momentum. If the Suns beat the Lakers, it'll be news for months. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Uh, let's get to the Trailblazers. Yusuf Nurkic with the Denver Nuggets down Jamal Murray. The Trailblazers have an especially inviting opportunity to make some noise this year. But winning such a series is no easy task when the Nuggets have MVP favorite Nikola Jokic healthy and cooking. Despite Murray's absence and the Blazers winning game one, Denver should still be the favorites. Jokic has been an elite postseason performer, and against Portland's 29th ranked defense, you have to expect his stellar play to continue. It's yet another feather in the Nuggets cap that the Blazers have nobody to bother Michael Porter Jr. Uh, However, in Yusuf Nurkic, the Blazers have a big man who might be able to make Jokic work a little harder than usual. In the two games that Nurkic played against the Nuggets, he held Jokic to 23 points, six rebounds, and four assists per game. Denver won the first game by one point, and Portland won the second game by 16, showing that Nurkic might know how to bother his former teammate just enough to make an impact. This trend continued Saturday evening as Jokic contributed 34 points and 16 rebounds, but was a minus 13 in 35 minutes and only managed one assist and a 14-point loss. If Nurkic is able to continue holding down the Ford against Jokic and Portland gets its usual postseason greatness from Lillard and McCollum, then things could get interesting out in Portland. I'm going to say it again. Yell at me if you want to. I don't care. Big men are key in the playoffs, in basketball, in anywhere. Uh, if you have a big guy, um, I mean, when I, when I went to high school, there was a guy who locally played here who was seven feet wow. tall wow. in high school. Wow. So – I mean, it, it, it's our just center, a guy. Our center at my high school was six five. Yeah, yeah. So there was a, a guy locally. He, he's seven feet tall. You just give it to that guy and let him just drop it in the bucket. And and, and so that that's what big guys do. You, Yusuf Nurkic has been a solid big man for Portland over the last. I mean, I, I mean, he seems like he's been there his entire career. So he he's definitely. I mean, to take the pressure off Lillard, take the pressure off the column, give it inside to to Nurkic, and if they don't stop it. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. No doubt about it. I totally agree. Utah Jazz. This one's pretty easy. Donovan Mitchell's ankle. We could have assigned injury-related risks to several teams here, but LeBron James, Anthony Davis, and Bradley Beal all got some reps in the play-in tournament and are relatively close to game shape, even if Davis's game one performance raises doubt. Donovan Mitchell, on the other hand, just practiced for the first time in over a month and is entering the hottest pressure cooker going as the Jazz surrendered home court advantage to the Grizzlies on Sunday night. The reason why we're listing Utah's all-star guard as their X-factor rather than, say, Jordan Clarkson is a simple one. The Jazz were the best team in the NBA for a large majority of the season, and if Mitchell is healthy and in good form, he'll help them maintain such dominance. The 24-year-old has improved each year, but he's really exploded in the playoffs. He led Utah to a surprise first-round victory over the Thunder as a rookie, and he averaged 36 points a game in that series in the series last year against Denver, on 53% shooting, 52% from three, and 95% from the line. If you insert playoff Mitchell alongside the rest of this Jazz roster, uh, this Jazz team becomes a uh, a regular season powerhouse with the star power to do ju- uh, just as much in the postseason. Here's hoping Mojo get, or Mitchell gets his mojo back quickly and rises to the occasion once again. I completely agree with this one. The Jazz without Donovan Mitchell average at best. 
the Jazz with Donovan Mitchell, one of the title contenders out of the West for sure. Sure are. And, 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 you know, Donovan Mitchell is one of the best. I mean, and we uh, say it again. I'm going to repeat myself. That's what I do. I repeat myself because I have nothing else to say. But, you know, it's a star-driven league. And and like like you said earlier, each team has a star. And it's Mitchell for the Utah Jazz. And, and if, I mean, in, injuries, like this thing says, uh, is something that could be assigned to a lot of teams here. But this one is really crucial because after – uh, after Donovan Mitchell, they really don't have a whole lot else there in Utah. So um, Jordan Clarkson is, is is I mean, he came out today that he's he's the sixth man of the year, and deservingly so. He's he's one of the best there is. But Jordan Clarkson can't win games by himself like Mitchell can. So um, they need Mitchell back if they're going to advance further to these playoffs. No doubt about it. And let's get to the last team, the Washington Wizards. Daniel Gafford is their X factor. And a move that flew under the radar at the deadline, the Wizards acquired, acquired, excuse me, big man Daniel Gafford from the Bulls. Buried on Chicago's depth chart, Gafford used the change of scenery to make an immediate impact as Washington proceeded to win 17 of 23 games that he played. That made she seem like a cherry-picked stat, especially since Russell Westbrook got rolling right around the same time. But Gafford shot 68% from the field, had the third-best net rating swing, and finished seventh in the NBA in block percentage. Make no mistake, the second-year big is contributing to Washington's success. Now the real challenge begins. Despite getting hot recently, the Wizards are long shots to win their first-round series against MVP finalist Joel Embiid and the Philadelphia 76ers. Gafford, in particular, faces one of the team's tougher tasks, protecting the rim against Embiid, Ben Simmons, and Tobias Harris. Given that the former Razorback is not a score-first player, his performance in this series will not break, make or break Washington's chances in it, However, at his best, Gafford's energy is contagious, and you can definitely picture an exciting defensive stand that turns into a fast-break opportunity for the Wizards, galvanizing the team for the rest of the game. He acquitted himself well in Game 1. He had 12.6 rebounds in just 20 minutes, so let's see if that continues going forward. At the very least, a good showing from Gafford against the East's top team will give Washington and its fans a very young and exciting big man moving forward. Yeah, Gafford is one of the players that helped the help uh, Washington beat the Pacers, uh, and, and the Pacers deserve to lose that series uh, for the sake of the for the sake of not only just uh, the you know the Pacers front office and the fans they didn't deserve to be there, but also for the sake of my hair. So <laughs> this is this is uh, G- Gafford is a player that um, th- th- like like this like this says. A very low-profile move acquiring acquiring Gafford at the deadline from Chicago, uh, but it's paid off for Washington, and they're they're a team that I think has the toughest task. They're not as great as uh, even though even with Westbrook and Beal, they still have a lot of work cut out for them. But uh, if Gafford plays well as well as Beal and Westbrook, uh, they they could win a series. Yeah, no doubt about it. All right, we got 20 minutes, about 20, 25 minutes of show left. Let's get into this newest member of the Wright State men's basketball team. C.J. Wilborn joins the Wright State Raiders, transferring from Milwaukee, according to head coach Scott Nagy earlier today. Wilborn is a 6'7 forward and has three years of eligibility remaining and joins the Raiders from Milwaukee, like I said. Uh, According to Coach Nagy, C.J. brings a big and physical presence to our program. We know he will be a great addition to our culture. He is an intelligent young man who is serious about everything he does, both on and off the floor. A member of the Horizon League All-Freshman team, Wilborn started 41 of his 45 games over the last two years in Milwaukee, averaging four and a half points a game and three rebounds a game as a freshman before averaging six points and three rebounds a game last season. He hit, uh, he shot at 48% from the floor and uh, shot uh, his freshman year and shot 51% last season. The first thing that jumps out at me uh, about C.J. Wilborn is uh, the depth at forward now for Wright State. You have Basili, uh, who's going to be a preseason Horizon League player of the year watch list. Uh, you have Loudon Love potentially coming back. We don't know about that. But if Loudon Love comes back, I mean, think let's pretend Loudon Love's coming back just because I think this makes this more fun. Basili <laughs> Love starting with also Tanner Holden. Uh, and then off the bench, you have Wilborn and you have Riley Voss, who they just got from Cornell. And then if you somehow lose one of those four, you still have Andrew Wellage and Andy Neff. Yeah, yeah. Of course, you lose Jalen Hall in the offseason, which hurts our, which hurts Wright State's defense, of course. 
Uh, but like you said, you still have you still have Loud and Love. If he comes back, we're pretending like he will, like he I'm will because it's, it's, he is until it breaks my heart. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, so yeah, you still have the silly. You still have Tanner Holden. You still got, got you guys like Wellage, Hebrick, and Tim Finke. So th- there are guys that um, you just add Riley Voss and, and now Wilborn to an already great group of guys and an already talented group of guys. Um, and, and we saw Wilborn. I mean, he he, play, he played well in, in the in uh, when Milwaukee came to the Nutter Center this past season. Uh, so I mean, he he's going to be. I expect him to bring the same kind of energy and the same kind of playing style uh, to the Raiders. And uh, and Scott Nagy has got to be thrilled to pick up a guy like Wilborn. Yeah, and like I said earlier, it's a win win because not only do you make your roster better, but you make Milwaukee's roster worse. And with Milwaukee just getting Patrick Baldwin Jr., one of the best high school kids in the country. Anything that makes that team worse is a win for Wright State. Right. And uh, anything that hurts the other Horizon League teams, I am for. Anything yeah. that helps Wright State, I am for. So uh, it make it makes our jobs a lot more fun. We'll sit here and talk about it all day because that's what we do. Um, and, if, and if Wright State's winning, our jobs are fun. And yep. if they're losing, it's not very fun. So yep. it, it, um, we and and that's true anywhere. So if you want to you want to talk about you want to have fun and you want to and it's when it, it's fun when the teams that you that we cover are winning. So um, and we we've been very fortunate that almost all of our programs here at Wright State are great and they win a lot. Um, so we're, we've been very lucky in that in that right. But uh, yeah, right, right, right. State adds Wilborn. He's, he's, I mean, he's, he's not just a great player. He's size. He's six, seven, adds size to an already, uh, an already big right state team. He's with, an athletic with, dude, too. With, with Loud and Love standing six foot nine, as well as Basili. Uh, so, I mean, he's six, like you said, he's six, seven, but he's athletic. So, a big guy who's, uh, who can move is killer in the Horizon League. And I think he'll bring, uh, uh just, just, just a lot, just a lot of fun to watch. Uh, a lot of tenacity, a lot of fight to Scott Nagy's club. And I like what Scott Nagy's doing this offseason because I think what we saw in that collapse to Milwaukee in the tournament last year and a lot of their losses over the course of the season was that they were so reliant on that starting five. They were so reliant on Loudon and Basili night in, night out that they never really had a game plan when Loudon or Basili had to get a breather or were in foul trouble. I love that. I mean, we're still going to ride Basili and Loudon this season or Basili and Holden or whatever the top two players are this season. Uh, Basile and Holden, they're going to be preseason conference player of the year candidates. And if Loud and Love comes back, I mean, he's got a chance to win a rising league player of the year as well. Uh, the Raiders really have three guys that can compete for play, player of the year this year. And that's terrifying. But um, I mean, now if Loudon or Basile gets into foul trouble or God forbid, one of them gets hurt, t- uh, CJ Wilborn and Riley Voss both have experience as starting forwards both have experience in, you know, systems. Uh, it's very similar to what Coach Nagy runs. I love that he added the forward depth because I think that's something that's held this team back. And I love that Scott Nagy's attacking the weaknesses of this roster. Yeah, yeah, weaknesses are killer, and we, we we've talked about it all the time. Weaknesses are killer, so uh, you, you need to address those weaknesses. And Scott Nagy's done that. Um, you lose you lose Jalen Hall, which is unfortunate, but Trey Calvin will be back. Uh, you, you, I mean, a guy who really accepted his role well last year He did uh, w- with uh, you know, there, there's, there's guys that um, I mean, there's guys that could be uh, upset and, 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 and just mad about it, but um, you, you, you gotta, you can either sit there and pout and, and, and let everybody see you and, and just feel bad for you, which no one is doing breaking no. the news. If you <laughs> sit on the bench and pout, no one feels bad for you. Nobody. you just, so just accept your role and uh, Jalen Hall, Trey Calvin, both did that very well last year. They did, and uh, you know, so the, the, uh, Wilborn adds adds a athleticism size to this Wright State roster, and this makes this Wright State Milwaukee matchup more interesting because Wilborn's come from Milwaukee, and Patrick Baldwin Jr. is headed to Milwaukee. So this matchup coming up this season when they come to the Nutter Center, this Nutter Center is going to be popping, no doubt about it. And don't forget about the defending champs, Cleveland State. They got uh, Torrey Patton back. They got Craig Bodeon back, one of their better defenders. They got uh, two very talented transfers. One uh, was the player of the year out of Pacific, uh, averaged like 15 points a game. And one came from Florida State and worked with Ken- uh, Coach Gates when Coach Gates was at Florida State. 
Um, so this Cleveland State team seems to have gotten better too. And obviously we talk about Northern Kentucky with Marquez War or Marquez Warwick and Trayvon Faulkner. We talk about um, you know, Youngstown State. Uh, they don't have Quisenberry, they don't have Bohannon, but they still have Akuche, they still have Garrett Covington, it's still a good team. Uh, there's six or seven teams right now that are contenders in the Horizon League, and that's really fun to say, but it's also kind of concerning as a right state fan. But I think if I had to pick right now, I think there's four that stand above and beyond the rest. And I think it's Milwaukee, Wright State, Cleveland State, and Northern Kentucky. Yeah. Could you imagine if Darius Quisenberry adds to this Wright State team? Oh, my God. Oh, my Lord. Wright State becomes the favorite if Quisenberry comes to Wright State. They do. They do. And and, and, and that's not to forget about Antoine Davis at Detroit. So Antoine can come to Wright State, too, if he wants. Yeah. Antoine, if you're out there listening, uh, and enter the portal I know right now. And, your dad's cool, but hey, Coach Nagy's pretty cool, too. Yeah, N- Nagy's a cool guy. We see him walking around campus all the time. Great guy. Yeah, we'd love to see you join him on those walks there, Antoine. So come come on down to Dayton. But um, yeah, so th- this is just, I mean, I-, I-, I agree with you. Northern Kentucky is always going to be a favorite, is always going to be tough in the in the horizon league, no matter who they have, especially with guys like Warwick and Faulkner. Uh, Cleveland State's going to be good as well. Coach Gates is one of, is uh, coming off a of coach of the year, which was well deserved. He just got uh, a big got, attention too. He's going to be a yeah. Cleveland State's coach through twenty twenty seven now. Yeah, you got Patton, you got Bodie on there still. Um, so and Cleveland State as well as uh, as well as Wright State. So there's contenders in the Horizon Lake. It makes the Horizon Lake a lot of fun to watch. I think it'll be very similar to last year, where there's five or six teams fighting for four spots. Yeah. So, um, you know. It'll be a lot of fun to watch. I, I I think Red State's the favorite right now. If they get Loudon Love back, um, they're they're still in that conversation even if they lose Loudon. But yeah, especially because uh, they got Wilborn today. So right, the, the, and, and but there's no doubt there's no doubt in my mind that the Horizon League is going to be so much fun coming up here this winter. No doubt about it. And with players like Patrick Baldwin Jr., with players like Tanner Holden, like maybe Loudon Love, like Antoine Davis, like um, Marquez Ward. I expect to see more Horizon League games on ESPN, on ESPN2, on ESPNU. There should be a lot more nationally televised Horizon League games this year, and this conference is going to get put on the map. And there's so many talented players. I'm excited for this league uh, because I think all the teams in it are going to get a lot of really good pre- uh, you know, uh, recognition this year. And there's going to be a lot of NBA scouts that naturally are looking at Patrick Baldwin Jr. And hey, Maybe they stumble upon a guy like Antoine Davis. Maybe they stumble upon a guy like Torrey Patton. Maybe they stumble upon a guy like Tanner Holden. Uh, this is going to be a good thing for the, everyone in the conference that Patrick Baldwin Jr. came to the Horizon League because it's going to put the rest of the league on the map as well. Yeah, yeah. So th- this is this is all about g- getting uh, your name out there. And Baldwin going to Milwaukee puts the Horizon League on the map. And that, and like you said, NBA scouts are going to be watching Patrick Baldwin Jr. And, and and like you said, maybe they they maybe maybe one day uh, loud and love just goes off or Tanner Holden just goes off or CJ Wilborn just has the game of their life mm-hmm. and and propels them to a new height propels Wright State and, and the Horizon League to new heights so uh, it's good it's great for the Horizon League it's great to see you know uh, some bigger name players go to the Horizon League it puts it puts uh, the Horizon League on the map as far as NBA prospects and NBA talent. And yeah. uh, as well as some of these big name networks to come uh, to come broadcast these these Horizon League games because Lord knows it's a lot of fun. Right, no doubt about it. All right, we're gonna end the show kind of continuing from yesterday, talking about some of the best stadiums in sports. Uh, again, this is a shout out to Ken on Facebook for giving us this topic idea. It's been a lot of fun. We actually had to stretch it out in two days. Uh, but uh, just one last closing thing. Uh, welcome C.J. Wilborn to Wright State. Uh, we are excited to see you play. And when we get closer to basketball season, I know you're technically the sports director now, but I'd love to see uh, a little bit of a, a mini interview segment with Riley Voss and CJ Wilborn and get to know the newest members of the Wright State Raiders. Yeah, yeah. Something that we'll work on as the as the, the season there. gets closer. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll, uh, we always want to provide the best possible content, and I think that will be fantastic to have Wilborn and Voss on yeah. uh, to kind of pick their brains and see what they're all about with Wright State. So. Uh, we'll work on getting that done and uh, excited for the season ahead, no doubt. Absolutely. Uh, Parker, we're going to start with college football here. I'm going to let you introduce it really quick. I'm going to turn off my camera for just a second, but I'll be back in like 30 seconds. So don't think we disconnected. I'll be right back. Why don't you start off with your three favorite college football stadiums? So for me, 
the three the three that come to mind is is it, it, it's it's pretty easy. I, I love uh, the uh, you know um, I think it was uh, I, I love I love watching you know uh, just in recent years it's been Clemson. The fans at Clemson are just, are just insane. And uh, they, they, they're just, they love uh, supporting the Tigers down there as well as people, people at Ohio State. I had no idea uh, coming into this year what uh, the fandom is at, at Ohio State. And I, and I got a taste of that. I mean, in, I mean if, every single Saturday, whether you go out anywhere in Dayton, anywhere in Ohio, you see Ohio State stuff, even, if, even in the, when they're not on. It's it's Ohio State everywhere. So uh, the fans in Columbus um, are are diehards, no doubt about it, as well yeah. as Clemson. And and even in recent years, LSU. You see LSU fans everywhere nowadays. Um, and, and another one that comes to mind for me, as far as popularity, is the Oregon Ducks. Yeah, I agree. What was your first one? I'm sorry, I heard Ohio State and Oregon. Clemson. Clemson. Okay. Uh, three that jump out to me, and I'm kind of glad that we have a little bit of a different opinion uh for me i go with bryant denny alabama um i think that tuscaloosa's just got such good history uh alabama fans are obviously very passionate about football just like any team in the south uh and uh they've had a lot of success recently with under nick saban so i think bryant denny jumps out at me the horseshoe's got to be up there for me as well i wouldn't be an ohio state fan if i didn't say that Uh, but two other ones that jump out to me uh or maybe i'm just a midwest guy but the big house, Michigan, got to be on there. And right. then Notre Dame. I mean, in yeah. Michigan, I mean, you got to, I think Notre Dame's just got such great history. And even I'll throw in Penn state in there as well. The house that Paterno built in happy Valley. Um, it feels like um, you get introduced to college football kind of based on the region that you're in, where I think a lot of people that grow up in, you know, central, the central U S uh, favorite big 12 stadiums and big 12 atmospheres like Texas and Oklahoma. You grow up in the South. You're thinking death Valley. You're thinking, uh, Bryant Denny, you're thinking, um, you know, the swamp in Florida, but I grew up in the Midwest. So what jumps to me when I think of college football atmospheres, Michigan, Ohio state, Penn state, Notre Dame. Yeah. And another one that pops in my mind for me is probably the biggest monstrosity in college football that I've ever seen. That's Kyle field at Texas A&M. Mm-hmm. It is massive. Um, and, and every single weekend that that place is packed, whether well, you yeah, I mean, you you go there, and, and I mean, even watching it on TV, I can't imagine what it looks like in person. But it's well, we just went, massive. We went to Houston my sophomore year for the the girls' team. Went to the uh, the NCAA tournament to play Texas a and We stayed at a hotel right across the street from Kyle Field. It is enormous, and just to tell you how, or just to kind of give you an example of how big that university is, Texas a and is the second largest college in the country in terms of total number of students, only behind the University of Central Florida, um, but. Uh, we went to, you know, go out to restaurants and stuff on the campus of Texas A&M that night. And it just, it feels like its own little city, man. College station is literally just another city in Texas. Um, we drove past the, uh, ROTC bunkers. Uh, you know, those little, like, uh, where they, they sleep and all that stuff. And there's right. rows of them, rows of them. And it's like, like. Wright State, I grew up in Fairborn, Ohio. I know Wright State's not the biggest school, but I've been to UC, I've been to um, Ohio State, I've been to UK, I've been to Tennessee, I've been to, you know, a couple of these pretty big schools. Texas A&M's on a different level, man. Texas A&M's huge. It's like its own little city, like I said. Yeah, so th- 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 there's a bunch that pop out uh, to me. Um, you know, you can go down the list. Uh, I mean, Alabama's obviously one of the best uh, as far as fan bases go, um, you know, you go across, across the, I mean, another one that, uh, you could mention is, uh, oh, um, you know, uh, the, uh, Memorial stadium at USC, uh, yeah. just, just the history there. The Rose Bowl. Um, um, I mean the Rose bowl there in, uh, in Pasadena as well. Um, but you know, there's just college football is, is just, it's just massive. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it, it's everywhere. You could, you could see, um, it's, it's just, it's, it's just everywhere, everywhere. Uh, college football's everywhere. And, and no matter where you go in the country, there's, there's, there's a team, yep. uh, that, that, that there's, there's represented. And, and even in, in States that, that, that are, that have nothing to do. Like, like I've seen people in Ohio wearing, you know, 
uh, Washington Husky stuff. Like yeah. what? Um, you know, like where does that come from? But uh, and, and I think it would be a crime if I didn't mention Ben Hill Griffin Stadium in Gainesville at the University of Florida. Yep. I mean, and that that stadium is packed every single weekend as well. The swamp. Um, right. So um, just a few that pop out to me are you know Clemson, Texas A and M, uh, as well as Memorial Stadium and Ben Hill Griffin in Gainesville. No doubt. Of, no. 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 No doubt about it. I just checked your Snapchat story and saw that you used my quote. Because <laughs> you roast you roasted me, and it happens seemingly every day. Oh uh, yeah, you should be used to it by now. Honestly, I don't know why I am. I um, am. But uh, we've had a fun show here today. We got about five ten minutes left here. Uh, let me look. We've got about nine minutes left. Um, so I want to end with college basketball because I think college basketball has got some of the best venues in sports. And the first one I'm going to throw out one that we're both very passionate about. Maybe it's not the best, but it's my favorite. And it's probably your favorite assembly hall in Bloomington, Indiana. Yeah, no doubt about it. I mean, uh, and, and, and the, the, the guy who really brought that, I mean, everybody knows Bobby Knight is the guy who put IU basketball on the map, and it, it's and it, Bobby Knight is why IU basketball is IU basketball. Um, it's just it's just unbelievable, you know. Um, the, the there are there are teams that have history, and, and there's 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 none uh, th- there's none like IU basketball. Nothing like IU basketball. The the um, you know just uh, you, a lot of most people don't. I know you understand that, but a lot of people don't understand how huge basketball is in Indiana. And I, people, a lot of people live, breathe, and die Indiana basketball, as well as they live, breathe, and die Purdue basketball. Uh, and, and for all of you Purdue fans out there, y'all suck. Just saying. Um, <laughs> if Jason's uh, listening, he's going to be upset. Yeah, you know. Uh, and Jason, I'm sorry. You are great at what you do. And, and, and we we both love you, but uh, Hoosiers all day. Uh, so, Agreed. um, as far as just sheer size for me, uh, you know the uh, uh and there you could go across uh the nation, but Rupp Arena at University of Kentucky. Yep is yeah. is just unbelievable yeah, one of my friends in high school ended up going to uk just because she wanted to go to basketball games she's been a uk fan since she was a kid and um she got me tickets to a game one time and it was such a fun experience oh my goodness um what a unique experience i mean people go crazy at rup i mean people the students show up two and a half hours before the game starts just so they can get the seats closest to the court um right. it's just a, it's an atmosphere unlike a lot of other ones in college basketball and um I'll throw out uh, as well. I mean, just thinking of the big three for me, uh, you know, in college basketball, it's Rupp, it's Cameron Indoor at Duke, and it's Chapel Hill at North Carolina. Right, right. Another one that jumps out to me, the biggest college basketball arena in the country, and that's the Carrier Dome at Syracuse. 34,000 people packed that place to watch Orange basketball. Um, Syracuse always seems to exceed expectations that every year people say Syracuse is going to be an average team. And every year it seems like they find their way to the Sweet 16. Yeah, yeah, no doubt about it. And uh, and another another team that jumps out at me is, uh, you know, uh, St. John's Hall Arena is actually at Mad- Madison Square Garden in New York mm-hmm. City. So um, another arena that, that is just so just packed with history. The Knicks play there, of course. Um, so uh, some of the best, I mean, one of the best uh, arenas in the entire country is Madison Square Garden. No doubt about it. And um, how about, I mean, uh, going back to college football, I don't know much about the college basketball stadium, but I just thought of Wisconsin, Camp Randall. Um, there's just so many different and unique environments. And I don't think I'd be a very good Dayton resident. I know you're from Indiana, but I wouldn't be a Dayton, a good Dayton resident if I didn't throw in UD Arena. I mean, the Dayton Flyers, I mean, as much as some of their fans drive me up the wall because they seem to think that their team would never lose to Wright State, even though that is a load of blasphemy. Um, we'll get to that another day. Um, but UD Flyers pack the arena unlike any other mid-major in college basketball. Uh, Dickie V, uh, Seth Greenberg, the game day crew went to UD Arena a couple days ago, and they said this is a top-10 arena in college basketball, and I agree with them. They just got it renovated. Now I think 13,000 fans fit inside UD Arena. 
Um, and it's, it's a unique experience unlike any other. I enjoy going to a UD basketball game any day of the week. Um, I'm a Wright State fan first. Uh, but I have nothing against the Flyers and their arena second to none. I mean, UD Flyers, the, the Netter Center, uh, I think Wright State could hang with the Flyers on the court, uh, but UD Arena trumps the Netter Center any day. Yeah, it does. As much as uh, as much fun as the Netter Center is, UD basketball is just, just uh, you know, a lot of uh, UD fans live, breathe, and die. Uh, Dayton basketball. I'm, there, not, so. I'm not. I'm not ignorant. UD is the big brother of college basketball in Dayton. Right, State's the little brother. It's how it is. Right, right. And another one that I love just here locally in Indianapolis is Hinkle Field House at Butler. Yeah. Um, and it was the uh the home of the real life Hoosiers. Um, uh, so uh, if any of you haven't seen that movie, highly recommend it. Uh, one of the best basketball movies ever made, but. Uh, well, we can talk about sports movies another day. Um, you know, I mean, I love Hank Field right themselves, man. Right, right. So, um, as far as college basketball goes, the, the, the it's just there's unmatched as as some of these. Uh, they they might they might not be the biggest monstrosities in in the world, but just the history that goes into these stadiums is just a lot of fun to dive into. Right, absolutely. Well, for the second consecutive day. We went in not sure what we were going to do after the first 45 minutes, and we end up running out of time. So uh, we appreciate you hanging out with us on this Tuesday afternoon, recording it on a Monday night, but you'll hear it on a Tuesday afternoon. Uh, apologies for you know having to record this while the games are going on. I wish we could break down the NBA games a little bit better, but uh, the, the Bucks blow out the heat, and I'll give you a score update here on the Nuggets before we leave. The Nuggets lead 53-35 over the Blazers. So it's looking like the Nuggets are off to a strong start in bouncing back in game two as well. Um, so uh, De- and that's something I kind of expected. I expected Denver to respond tonight. And uh, I think that that's something that it looks like is happening. Uh, so uh, enjoy the rest of the Nuggets and Blazers tonight. Uh, and then uh, we'll see you, uh, I guess, again on Wednesday. But uh, Parker, any closing thoughts here on uh, this Tuesday edition of Keep It Real? Yeah, you know, it's, it's, I mean, we, like you said, we, we go in, talk, have like 45 minutes of content and end up running out of time. Um, which, I mean, we didn't mean to, we're having fun. Right, right. We're having just uh, loads of fun. We didn't mean for this stadium segment to be three days long. We meant it for it to be maybe a half hour long, but, uh, we just, we just get so into talking about the NBA playoffs that we just run out of time with everything else. So, um, you know, uh, it, it's it's good to see the Nuggets bounce back tonight. I thought they would. Um, so uh, just uh, hope you all enjoy the rest of playoff basketball from you know this evening. But when you hear it, it'll be the next day. But I uh, hope you enjoyed the Julio Jones drama going on from it's just getting started Tuesday, from from Monday afternoon. So um, we'll uh, I we'll, hope you hope you all enjoyed today's show, and uh, we'll see you tomorrow. Yeah, absolutely. Couldn't agree more. And uh, we appreciate you hanging out with us. Like I said, whether it's on WWSU 106.9 FM or on our YouTube feed, we just got named show of the week on WWSU 106.9. So we appreciate that support. We couldn't do it without you literally. Um, And on our, our YouTube feeds been blowing up, man. I did not expect this many people to be invested in the show on YouTube and it's been a blast. Yeah. Yeah. Like we said early in hour number two, your support has been unbelievable. It's, it's why we do what we do. We couldn't do it without uh, the support. So we greatly appreciate all of you out there for the support that this show has gotten to this, up to this point. Uh, we both know that this could some at point at some point come to a crashing halt. Uh, but we, we, now we it's fun. right. We, we, we'll have fun. We're having fun while it's lasting. And, and uh, we hope you guys are having fun listening as well. No doubt about it. All right. Well, we appreciate you hanging out with us. And until tomorrow, for Parker Testa back in Noblesville, I am Shane Neal saying so long. And until next time, keep it real with Testa and Neal. We'll see you tomorrow.